Good afternoon, everyone, uh, to the person present here in Parma in this meeting room, but also good afternoon and good morning to all people connected online. On behalf of ESSA and the Inter-European Reference Laboratory Working Group of the European Commission on Whole Genome Sequencing, I would like to welcome you to this conference. This is the second meeting of the Science Meets Policy Conference Series. The first event took place in 2020, in September, only online, unfortunately. And I'm very pleased to see you, so many of you here, both in the meeting room, but also connected. So the meeting today will focus on EU initiatives toward large-scale use of next-generation sequencing to tackle foodborne threats. My name is Valentina Rizzi, I'm working in EFSA in the Unit on Biological Hazard, Animal Health and Welfare, and I'm the leader of the Biological Monitoring Team. My role today is to introduce this first session, introductory session, to set the scene of this conference. And this uh, session will include two presentations. The first one is a welcome speech by our Executive Director, Bernard Rurl, who will explain a bit about uh, why we decided to organize this, con this conference and why now. The second speech will be given by Stefano Morabito, and we, he will explain a bit about uh, the main topics of the conference. Before starting with this uh, first session, some housekeeping information. So the conference is recorded, and the recording will be published on the EFSA website, together with all presentation given by the speaker shortly after the event. But also we will welcome all your comment question using Slido, and you will see later on on the screen uh, the QR code of this Slido. This Slido Q&A function will be activated after the round of presentation for each session. And some of these questions might be presented and asked to the speakers and also discussed during the Q&A session that we will have after each session, but also tomorrow during the moderated session that will close the conference. Now, I think it's time to start with the discussion and with the conference. So is, I'm very pleased to leave the floor to Bernard Orl, the EFSA Executive Director for the welcome speech to the conference. Bernard, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Valentina, and a warm welcome. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depends on wherever you are around the globe, to you here in the room, but also to all our colleagues and uh, interested parties who are connected online. We at EFSA are very proud to host this conference today and tomorrow, and it builds, as Valentina said, on the first conference in 2020, with the aim to, to sort of investigate and potentially improve the interface between science and policy. And uh, we say, when evidence or science meets values, it starts to be interesting, no? because we say we do evidence, we do scientific advice, and then we throw this into the arena of policymaking, where values, values about how society should be organized, uh, sort of guide policy decisions. And this interface between science and values is an interesting one, and risk assessment is sort of a bridge, tries to bridge this interface between science and policy making. The idea of the first conference and also of the event today and tomorrow is to, to pave a way for a dialogue between science and policy making. Why do we have this event and why do we have it now? We think that uh, genomic data sharing is now at a turning point. We believe from a technical and methodological point of view, we are ready to use uh, WGS data more widely and with more, with more impact, so to speak. Because most, well, not all, but let's say many of the methodological problems have been solved, a technical infrastructure has been built, and uh, we could use it more widely. And I think there's no doubt, at least within the community, that uh, data sharing 
adds value. It adds value because it leads to faster outbreak detection and better tracing exercises. It increases the likelihood of connecting sporadic cases to clusters and detect outbreaks. And there is also measurable economic impact in the US. And we have colleagues from the United States also here. The genome tracker uh, system in the US, their network has proven to also save quite an, a significant amount of money. And this is also, I think, not difficult to understand. However, despite the knowledge that it adds value to shared data, there are quite some obstacles still. We know the benefits and still there are obstacles that prevent, in a way, to use it more widely. There are technological gaps because not all member states, not all organizations use WGS um, technology on a routine basis. There's also sort of a worry that uh, um, people and countries say we don't have a robust legal basis to share data. So are we allowed to share data? There, there are doubts about that. There's also sort of a fear that people say we lose control over our data. We produce the data, we share it, we don't know what happens with the data afterwards. Especially when it comes to, you know, flowing the data through the system and who will use the data afterwards. There's also a concern that if this technology would be used widely, many more clusters would be detected which is good from a public health uh, point of view, but it also would increase the workload of the national authorities to follow up and to uh, deal with uh, clusters that have been detected. There could even be, I would not exclude that, economic considerations that countries would say, we are not so keen of showing to everybody around the world which sort of clusters, problems, outbreaks we have in our country. Might not be true, but maybe that is also a bit of an underlying point. And last but not least, if there would be cases of litigation, people have fears about what about traceability of data, uh, how is this data used across the whole chain. So there are barriers, there are benefits, which I think you all and we all believe in. And this is why we have this conference. The objective is to to gain something like a collective understanding about the blockers and explore solutions how to overcome them. And we think in the situation we are in now, it seems unwise to wait for a top-down solution in the way that legislators would define the rules of the game. We think that we, the WHS community, can do and must do our part to create the conditions for success. And we think we are convinced there's a lot we can do to move data sharing forward within the current legislative framework. What would that be or how could that be? First, I think we still have to work on creating a mutual understanding about benefits and limitations of this technology. We would have to agree on common guidelines, on processes, on procedures. I think that's very important because otherwise we wouldn't really know um, how to compare uh, different outcomes. We would to have to act as open as possible, but also as confidential as needed, because there's a, there's a fine line that we have to find between to be as open as possible, but also to be confidential if it's needed. And then we would need to put a governance in place that empowers the stakeholders, first of all, to prioritize what to do first, but also to set limits if needed, because resources uh, may become an issue if we would use this technology on a massive basis. And last but not least, from my point of view, we also have to build trust within the WGS ecosystem. And only then, if we have done our work, one could think and might wish to codify the rules of cooperation via legislative measures, if needed at all. Maybe it's not even needed. Our role as EFSA, we have tried to be something like a small catalyzer in a big ecosystem. We have invested resources, significant resources, I would say, in creating a technological infrastructure for enabling WGS data sharing, mainly to tackle foodborne threats. And furthermore, together with our European partners, we have tried to champion and to promote dialogue between scientists and stakeholders on methodologies, on standards, processes in the field of uh, WHS uh, within uh, the area of foodborne pathogens. I can promise that we will continue to do our part 
to move uh, genomic data sharing forward and we hope to create additional momentum for collaboration with this event. That's exactly the purpose of this event, to create a momentum that people say, oh, actually, that's interesting. Maybe I, my organization, also could contribute to do a bit more to do the next step in this collaboration. That's basically it. It seems to be simple, no? But it's not always simple, even if it looks simple. So, dear colleagues, I would like to thank you for having joined this conference and for creating more value also by sharing WGS data. I wish you all an interesting and fruitful meeting here in Parma and online. And with this, I give back to you, Valentina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernard, for this welcome speech, but also for setting the scene and explaining why we have decided to organize this conference, why now? And uh, now is the time of the next uh, speaker, Stefano Morabito, who will uh, describe more about the main topics that will be discussed during the conference. Stefano is the head of the European Reference Laboratory for Escherichia coli at the National Institute of Health in Italy, and also the chair of the Inter-European Reference Laboratory Working Group of the European Commission on All Genome Sequencing Data. So now is your turn, Stefano. Come, please, on the stage, and the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Valentina, for the kind introduction, and you know, uh, welcome everyone. I would like to uh, really thank the European Food Safety Agency for, you know. Um, accepting to work together in the organization of the second event. As a matter of fact, it has been said before by Valentina, this uh, follows a first event on that, which was uh, organized by the Inter-European, uh, Inter-URL Working Group on NGS. Um, and in that occasion, the brand, let's say, Science Meet Policy was uh, created because the idea was to organize a series of events which would follow the pathway towards the establishment and use the fruitful use of the WGS to tackle foodborne infections. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, this is the second one, and uh, I guess it's the green one. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, this uh, um, conference uh, follows the first one. The first one was meant to be, of course, online. When we started organizing the event, we didn't know anything about the pandemics, of course. So the uh, conference was uh, scheduled on March 2020. Then, you know, <laughs> we have been a bit prophetic, but we, we had nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, let me say, uh, then, you know, the pandemic happened and uh, uh, disrupted all the plans that we had. So at the beginning, we say, okay, let's move it after the summer. Probably, the, the, you know, this mess will be over and we can actually gather together and discuss as we like to do. But then we did, I mean, the things went differently and uh, we went totally online. Nevertheless, we could gather together a lot of people. And, you know, witnessing uh, the huge interest that the world has started to, uh, to pour, to devote to the, to the use of WGS for tackle the food infection. And as you can see from the map, you know, of course, most of the participants were from Europe because of the European size of the organization, but actually it was definitely open to the rest of the world. And as a matter of fact, we had North America, South America, Africa, and a bit of Asia, not far Asia, but the close uh, Asia, uh, yes. And uh, we had 521 registered participants, we were, which was a huge goal, particularly because at that time, we were not even sure that the whole online system would work. We had, we, I mean, we were not so experienced, so we have been, you know, with this uh, heartbeat uh, accelerated because everything could crash at, at any moment. But it didn't happen, and we, we could gather together people from 49 countries in the world, which, in my opinion, was a huge uh, result. 
And also, uh, what I believe it's important to be underlined is that the provenience of the participant was uh, really diverse. I mean, of course, the laboratories were the most, uh, no, I wouldn't say interested, but, you know, those that were closer to the core meaning of the events. But as a matter of fact, we had authorities and risk assessment institutes that also showed up at the conference and, you know, spent uh, a few words in discussing with us, uh, even though, of course, the core was... Uh, uh, and the accent was set on the technical issues because at that time, technicalities were the most important aspect. Because, you know, the capacity was, uh, I wouldn't say at, in, at its infancy, but was not, certainly not established as it is now. And uh, this is also witnessed by, you know, the, uh, this is the, work, the, the conference agenda, and you can see that the two agencies, EFSA and ECDC, actually brought their own vision on the state of play, because the system was not rolled out yet. And, uh, you know, there was uh, a lot of discussion about, uh, is it useful? Oh, yeah, it is. I mean, we are using about that. Yes, we, we are. And how do you use it? How can you share whatever? But there were quite a few points that indeed emerged, and emerged uh, sharply from the conference. Uh, this is one of the slides presented at the conference at that time. I'm pretty sure that many of you here and at home or wherever you are in the world had participated in the conference. So probably you have seen it, but it is important because this is part of the message that was delivered. You know, the world is started starting using WGS to tackle food infection and since uh, the beginning of the introduction of this technology, these signals, increased, Bernard said quite, uh, you know, um, neatly. If, if the signal increase, the workload will increase, but also the sensitivity of the whole system will increase, which is the ultimate goal of using such, uh, you know, uh, sensitive technologies to, to, to get signals. And this uh, graph represents the increasing in the rapid outbreak assessment conducted jointly by EFSA and ECDC since the introduction of the WGS um, in the field of uh, fibrin infection, of course. But there's another slide that I would like to show you, and it's one slide presented by George, who will speak at this conference as well, and uh, uh, that reported his experience as a lawyer dealing with uh, this kind of um, situation in which a science impacts quite profoundly on uh, people's life. And he could highlight at least three points. Uh, I mean, at least those points are those that I believe it's important to uh, underline right today, because uh, you will see uh, it will be more or less the base from this conference to be done and for the discussion to be uh, developed. And actually, he uh, highlighted that there were issues related with the use and the sharing of this kind of data to tackle food burn infection, either at the authorities level. You know, it's not just the workflow that increases, but also the lack of clear rules and, you know, roles and responsibilities that also impact the workflow of the authorities because, I mean, yeah, now we have a signal, what can we do with it? And this is a point, because there are not explicit regulations setting the rules for the use and the sharing of these data. But also, there were, I mean, another point was related with issues uh, impacting directly on the citizens, which are the patients, because this kind of a data, they didn't even know they could be used to manage the infection they were, you know, affected at the moment. And uh, also the idea of, you know, uh, the possibility of getting out a signal of personal contamination of those data would be a kind of a sensitive piece of information because it's related with passions 
directly. And last but definitely not least, the food industry uh, would be strongly impacted by that because, uh, you know, most of the, of the controls are done by the food industry. And as a matter of fact, they might not be that willing to sequence everything, or even when it happens, they would be uh, probably um, they would probably know how those signals could be used. Even though there are the two sides of the story, I mean, they, such signals can be used to uh, involve a company or to exclude the presence of a company into a given event, and this is a point. So. Um, the, in that occasion, also, the plenum, although it was scattered all over the world, was poked to reply to a set of questions related with, uh, on one side, the technical part of the story and the um, legal framework side. And as you can see from here, there was a kind of a general concern about the absence of a legal framework and the issues with the data confidentiality. Not just because of the uh, possibility to use those data to track subjects or companies, but also because there is a kind of, uh, you know, um, a confusion about the ownership of the information. Who does data belong to? I mean, if I, as a laboratory, isolate a bag from a patient or from a given food item, and then I sequence the bag, do the sequence belong to me or belongs to the food producers or the patients or the hospital or who? And this is not a mundane question. This is not trivial because it's part of the equation. If we want to transfer A from A to B, a given piece of information, we, I need to know who the owner is. And this is a point, and the, uh, and the other point, although the general, general impression was that it was absolutely necessary to have such a system, but the disclosure of such sensitive information uh, from the general participant uh, was related with the economic impact and the privacy impact. And so these, these uh, were the more uh, important point at the merge of the conference, and as a matter of fact, these were the key messages that have been uh, rolled out at the end of the of the conference. Uh, you know, okay, the approach, I mean, it's effective. It works. Simply, it works, and we know that it works. And uh, the capacity at that time was being built, but now I can say that also, thanks to the work done by the European Reference Laboratory and the Inter-European Reference Laboratory Working Group on NGS, a lot has been done, but there are still some obstacles, partly because of the need of resources. I mean, the technology is not cheap. Actually, is much cheaper than it was in 2020. But at that time, it was not that cheap, and then those obstacles related with the lack of a framework. Not necessarily a legal framework, but a framework in, any, in many sense, you know, in the broader sense, rules, roles, and responsibility. And this is why we decided together with uh, uh, the European Food Safety Agency, which I would like to remind you is an observer into the uh, working group uh, uh, amongst the European Reference Laboratory together with CDC, decided that it was time to start talking about that because this is now the real obstacle. I mean, the capacity is out there. Uh, the European Reference Laboratories do, uh, you know, take under control that capacity, deliver EQAs, deliver reference material, technology and services to the, to the national reference library. So the cascade in Europe, is, at least in Europe, is ensured. Uh, we know that uh, next October it will be released the call for the European reference laboratory in the public health sector. So most probably this is uh, expected to grow to consolidate over the next few um, months at least, but still there's the need to cover the framework. And this uh, sets uh, the real objective of this um, conference. Certainly to encourage the dialogue, you know, to keep, gather people together to talk about this kind of issue, 
uh, and the, uh, the needs and the possibility to set up a standard for sharing the information with the purpose of using uh, WGS data to tackle foodborne infection, but also to identify specific action points. Because this may compose a roadmap, and once you have a roadmap, you know how to deal with it. You know the direction that needs to be taken. Of course, we are not regulators, so we cannot take decisions, but certainly we can provide evidences and knowledge and sound scientific basis to the regulators for them to uh, you know, decide how to move. Bottom up, top down. It, it has to be seen, but at least we will know how to move our steps in uh, this whole story. I would like to thank you again, everyone, also on behalf of all the inter-URL working group on NGOs, and enjoy the event here and behind the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano, for summarizing so well the outcome of the previous conference and also for highlighting the main blockers that were those uh, triggering the organization of the second conference. And also it's important that you highlighted very clearly which are the main topics that will be discussed, but also the objective of this conference. So thank you very much to the speakers of this first introductory session, Bernard Hurl, the FC Executive Director, and Stefano Morabito. And now I think it's uh, the time to start with the first session of the conference that will be about the current One Health approaches implemented in the EU and in the EU member state. And this session will be chaired by Valeria Michelacci. She is, uh, is a biotechnologist biotech working at the European Reference Laboratory for Escherichia coli at the National Institute of Health in Italy. But she is also a member of the Inter-European Union Reference Laboratory Working Group of the European Commission on NGS. So I leave to you the floor to chair this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. Thank you, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to introduce this uh, first session of this great meeting. So as Valentina was saying, we are going to hear about uh, uh, the current uh, One Health approaches implemented in Europe and in single member states uh, for uh, using, uh, collecting, using and sharing genomic data to tackle uh, football pathogens. So um, the first presentation we will have will, will be um, delivered by uh, EFSA and the CDC representatives. Uh, so to hear about uh, um, approaches uh, uh, in Europe, uh, while the second presentation will be uh, delivered from three different uh, representatives of three member states. Uh, but uh, this is for you to know that uh, it's important for you to know that we, will go in, we are going to have only one question and answer session for these two big presentations uh, that will be um, at the end of, the, of all the presentations. Uh, there will be the possibility to give uh, um, questions either for for people uh, uh, participating here uh, and also for people participating remotely. In this uh, second case, uh, people will be uh, able to use the Slido application for posting questions uh, and the possibility to uh, post questions will be opened uh, at the end of a presentation. So please to uh, people participating remotely, take note of your uh, questions and uh, release them when it's activated. Um, so um, this first presentation will be um, about uh, uh, the um, system developed by EFSA and ECDC jointly, and in fact it will be delivered jointly uh, by Dr. Mirko Rossi, that I uh, would like to welcome on stage. He is, uh, Mirko is a scientific officer and bioinformatician at the European Food Safety Authority, uh, and uh, he will uh, deliver the presentation jointly with uh, Priyanka and Anna Veneni. Uh, that, uh, okay, here you are, uh, that will uh, follow with the, um, the implementation performed at the ECDC, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. So uh, please, Mirko, it's your time. The, the floor is yours to introduce the WGS system. Thank you. Okay, thank you a lot for having me. Um, today I'm going to present you the work done in the last uh, four years in EFSA and together with the CDC. Um, 
I guess Bernard and Stefano were clearly state uh, what actually as the starting point we were facing in 2020 when we start to, actually 2019 when we start to design the roadmap for implementing the data collection at the EFSA level. Um, what is very important is we should we consider clear, clearly all the obstacles at that time, in particular the distinct uh, sector, different type of organization. We have a different state, member state level. We have technical obstacles. We have different uh, IT infrastructure in the cities in Africa to take into consideration. We have different regulation, legal and ethical um, background. We need to take into consideration ownership, responsibility, as uh, uh, Stefan was pointing out. And of course, we need to work toward uh, facilitating to overcome economical difficulty from the technological point of view. Therefore, we were just um, working closely with the CDC to find out the correct approach that we could use at European setting for triggering and facilitating the WGS data sharing. Here is just a, a very quick, like a, a university type slide, I would say, sorry for that, but uh, just to let us remember a general distinction about uh, the models of uh, uh, data sharing. So we have accessibility models where we have mainly an open data sharing model, where we have clearly positive and pro of having a wide distribution and fostering innovation, but maybe uh, some privacy concern and potential misuse. Uh, uh, and control network data sharing, which is actually implied that we have uh, uh, a network of appointed people, a close network of people that have shared data, uh, and which is, uh, of course, of the proper responsibility use and trust building, uh, but then might have a potential access limitation data sharing coordination. From the other side, we have also a management model that we should take in consideration. So how we, we do, so we centralize everything or we decentralize, so we just use the data on demand. Then we, uh, here you can try to understand maybe pro cons of the two models, but just to say that and, and it is clear that we don't have one fit for all model. We should try to uh, decide what was the best model that was uh, applicable in a European setting from EFSA point of view or from a CDC point of view. Therefore, we just end up with a, um, a combination of approaches. Uh, in a nutshell, dividing a, a control centralized data sharing at certain level, where EFSA and ECTC collect the data centrally based on the remit and the um, specific, uh, uh, for example, IT limitation or uh, um, regulations, uh, privacy and other type of ownership problem. And then uh, establishing a seamless cross-sectoral co collaboration where um, the, the interoperability, the cooperability between the two systems will allow to, uh, a seamless integration and share data when actually that is needed. This cartoon shows you, it's a very, very old cartoon. I guess some of you saw that picture already four years ago. I think that I'm just showing it every time, so I'm so sorry for that. But uh, I guess it's still a valuable feature where it clearly shows that we uh, try to focus in in centralizing data collection for our uh, for our um, setting and then try to uh, uh, able to uh, share the data. In 2020, then the uh, uh, mandate of commission arrived, uh, actually 2019, but uh, we start in 2020, and there have been a clear indication that we need to have two systems focused in collecting data and facilitating cross-sectorial data sharing uh, and uh, with the scope uh, of uh, facilitating cluster detection and investigation. The system is uh, on production and live since July 2022. So now I'm going to go, um, just sorry, before we go straight on EFSA, this was possible. And one of the most important actions we took in the last three years was uh, uh, getting FCCC sitting and agree on a specific uh, uh, interaction through our collaboration agreement, which is available and uh, is available in our EFSA website, so you can um, read carefully our interaction. In this agreement, uh, we carefully statement how we interact, uh, how we consider the data, who is the owner of the data, how the data be used, uh, and what actually will be visible between the two systems and the corresponding uh, um, remit uh, and network. In particular, for example, one of the most critical information that be shared between us is country information. We can, you can imagine the country is the most critical information that we are collecting and we have a specific rule how the country information is shared and visible in the respective network. But let's go a little bit quicker on, uh, on how we can uh, um, show specifically on SWS system. 
So the original goal was to build up a database that was uh, uh, defined for as a baseline for the for discover cluster with food data. And also the database should account, should support uh, uh, real-time investigation when a multi-country event is actually ongoing. In addition, we have to support member states to give them uh, uh, improving collaborative uh, action and partnership uh, and giving also added value capacity. So who can access the uh, DEFSA platform is a, uh, is a very large network of over 132 data providers across Europe. Uh, we have two types of uh, main actors in our system. One is a data provider who actually give data to the system. And the other one, what we call it, is a country officer. So it's one single point in the country where EFSA is interconnected and actually is responsible for the validity, validity of the data and the actually correct use of data from the member states. Who, uh, when the data are sharing? So the, 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 data, the platform is open all the time, 20, 24 hours seven. So we, there is no limitation time. But of course, we notice we have two patterns that we are actually following. The member state give us data or reactive because we have actually an event ongoing. We actually, actually ask people, give us data. We need to investigate, we need to perform an action. Or proactively, and that's what actually we want to aim for in the future. We want just people really give data on a so-called peacetime in terms of there is no event going on, but we need to collect data to try to build up the database we want to explore. What we are sharing. So for who is more um, familiar with the type of data we are uh, collecting, we are not actually sharing the raw sequencing information. So the FASTQ, some of you know what does it mean. Uh, we are not sh actually sharing this. We are actually collecting transformed data and metadata describing the original raw data. And, and what we are actually sharing uh, and putting in the in a, in a sharing between different users, different sector, is actually the typing data. So the data, we actually we use it for performing an investigation, for performing the analysis which is used for the investigation. And how we are sharing, I'm just going really quickly, we have two modality, uh, and depending on the capacity of the member states. So do you, if you need us to support you in the analysis, you can transfer momentarily your FASTQ to our infrastructure, let us to pay the computer resources needed for transforming that in typing data, and then moving that data in a database. Alternative, you are enoughly capable, you can work with us to actually analyze yourself, your data, and then just give us the data when it's ready to be shared. So this is try to accommodate all possible needed in terms of uh, uh, data sharing, uh, some, and accommodate also the need of some member state to protect the FASTQ or the raw sequence data if they, want, they, they are not able to or wanted to share. And finally, how we interact. We interact mainly uh, as a support of ECDC. So ECDC will show you in briefly, uh, we have uh, indicator-based surveillance or uh, event-based surveillance. It's a different surveillance methodology they imply for following uh, foodborne uh, uh, pathogens. And uh, we establish a specific way how we interact. So uh, regardless uh, how the, 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 the trigger, they always query our system. They are free to do it in any time. We are monitoring from our side uh, what actually are performing. And just to give you a number, in the last year, they query us over 30,000 times. And during this, approximately 2,500 times every month. And uh, apart a few times that we have some little bit problem, but very little, we didn't have uh, any very issue and was very seamless in coordination. But how is a member, member state contribution so far? This is a very important slide for me to show. Um, it, it, it's not like we open the system and in, in, a, you know, in a second we have just thousands of data collected. What it for sure is important to note that we are gradually instruct member states how to, or building up this trust which is needed for collecting and, and uh, sharing data. And you can see that across the year, this is to show you particularly last year, uh, we are increasing sometimes, uh, we are following a sort of uh, mod, uh, bimodal distribution of data collecting, following actually our open data call. So we noted that still member states are working working toward the give data as a, pro as proactive, uh, as a reactive sorry, uh, response. But, and also show that uh, we have a contribution for member states. Uh, 
We are very happy for that, but still we have a lot of bias. Few member states are contributing practically over 60% to our data set. So, of course, uh, we still need to work a lot with the member states, but we are extremely uh, happy about the success we have this year, especially because uh, we know that maybe it doesn't, the numbers are little compared to the total number available uh, already also line, but we know that these actually data are the actually data that we have to use it for spe performance specific action. And now we give space to uh, uh, Priyanka, who will just speak about uh, the ECDC part. Thank you, Priyanka. Okay, let's see. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priyanka Nanapaneni, and I'm working as a scientific officer of bioinformatics in the microbiology and molecular surveillance group at ECDC. Thank you, Valeria, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Miko, for introducing the joint ECDC EFSA One Health system. So today I'm going to talk about the ECDC's um, um, perspective on the One Health system. So ECDC has a strategic framework document um, that has a list of prioritized pathogens and a prioritized diseases, and also it has outlined a technical documentation options for integration of the molecular surveillance data, for example, the genomic typing as well as the um, molecular typing data into European surveillance system. So this is particularly relevant in terms of multi-country outbreak investigations that allows for the real-time information sharing, analysis for rapid risk assessments, and targeted public health response, and also transmission control. And this is also relevant for the continuous surveillance of data, which is a control-oriented surveillance, where we have a real-time with maximal disease sampling frame for early outbreak detections. Also, we have strategy-oriented surveillance, either by Sentinel's continuous surveillance or also periodic surveys with representative sampling frames for program evaluation, as well as enabling trend monitorings. So we have different types of surveillance systems in place at ECDC. And for the indicator-based surveillance, we are primarily using TESI, which is the European Surveillance System Database. This is mainly intended for the collection, analysis, as well as dissemination of surveillance data. And specifically for an event-based surveillance, like for example, for an outbreak investigations, we are using EpiPulse, which is the European Surveillance Portal for Infectious Diseases. And EpiPulse is a platform that is designed for collecting, analyzing, sharing, and discussing infectious disease data for threat detections, monitoring, risk assessments, as well as outbreak responses. So EpiPulse has several modules in it. For example, it has a module called Events, Signals, and Threats, where countries are actively involved and discuss um, among themselves in terms of a specific event, for example. But also it has a separate module called EpiPulse Molecular Typing, where the whole genome sequencing data are visualized in the EpiPulse Molecular Typing. Um, soon, um, probably at the end of next year, TESI will be replaced by EpiPulse Cases. So EpiPulse will be the sole platform for ECDC that involves from the data collection until the data visualization. ECDC also has strategy-oriented surveillance, example through the structured service that enables us to do the trend monitoring. So if you look at the overall cluster process flowchart or overall um, what happens during the analysis phase of the isolates at ECDC, the member states um, submit the metadata through their routine um, surveillance activities to the TESI. So this includes all the epidemiological information associated with the particular isolates. And then the accompanying whole genome sequencing data currently is submitted through different platforms, like via ECDC Upload app or ECDC SFTP platform, for example. Um, in case if member states already has shared relevant um, in sequencing data, for example, in a public repositories, and we actively encourage them to do so, in that case, they can share us the identifiers, and we could fetch the public data from a public domain. And along with this, we also skim routinely the public domain for the relevant public data that is associated with an ongoing events or outbreaks. And also in terms of an ongoing event, um, the countries are actively involved in the event forum in the EpiPulse, and they can discuss the various events happening in the EpiPulse um, during the event. And they also have a possibility to update the sequences directly in the EpiPulse events, which enables the faster and the timely data um, analysis during an ongoing event. Um, so the primarily all the data analysis at ECDC currently is done using bionumerics. 
and uh, soon it will be replaced, um, I mean, it will be phasing out at the end of next year. So ECDC is developing in-house cloud bioinformatics pipelines um, that enables the data analysis at ECDC. So normally the cluster flow for all the pathogens at ECDC is that after analyzing in bionumerics, so we go through the cluster analysis and all the cluster information is then shared to the EpiPulse databases and eventually visualized in the EpiPulse molecular typing. To enable here the ECDC EFSA one health joint WGS system, so for the pathogens like Listeria, Salmonella, and E. coli currently, these are all subjected to the chewy allele calling. ECDC and EFSA ensures that we are using the same schemas and also same version controls for these, um, um, for these analysis. So all of these clusters, in case for Listeria, all of these clusters every week were subjected to the querying to the EFSA system. For Salmonella, we are currently doing in an ad hoc basis in an ongoing event or in an ongoing outbreak investigation, for example, we are querying it in an ad hoc based for Salmonella. So all of these um, are queried to the ECDC in-house database, um, as well as the ECDC curate, um, sorry, EFSA in-house database, and also EFSA publicly curated database as well. And any possible food matches or non-human matches, for example, all of these are transferred to the EpiPulse database, and eventually the final step is the visualization of this data. So EpiPulse, we are using molecular, molecular typing tool for visualizing all of these whole genome sequencing data. And together, if there's any non-human matches for any of those clusters, they can be viewed together with the human isolates. So we would like to acknowledge the support from the member states for the actively um, sharing the data to ECDC. So in 2019, ECDC opened EU EEA wide um, whole genome sequencing enhanced surveillance and opened for the data submissions to member states. So um, till now, we are collecting, we collected more than 6,000 isolates in Listeria database, and this is coming from 32 countries. And similarly, we also have more than 6,000 isolates for Salmonella, and this is from 30 different countries. So these data are collected as part of like routine data submission, annual reporting of the data, but also the data collected as part of an ongoing events or an outbreak investigations. So similar to EFSA database, we also have slightly uneven distribution of data from member states. As you can see in the pie charts here, both for Listeria and Salmonella, there are some countries which are actively represented and, and submitting the data uh, in the routine data submissions, whereas some countries are also actively engaged only in terms of specific outbreak or event investigations. So we are aiming to improve this and we are making sure that we get an even distribution of data by actively engaging member states and encouraging them to do the routine data submission and also engaging them more actively in terms of an outbreaks. And now, for example, for this EFSA ECDC joint system, engaging them to show the more value that is in the system together with the both the human and food matches, for example. So for Listeria, um, if we go to the overview of the um, clusters, for example, so in total, we have 661 clusters um, that have uh, for the Listeria. And then majority of these clusters are mainly based on the single country clusters, so the national clusters, for example. And 161 of these clusters belong to the multi-country clusters. And if you look at the statistics of these multi-country clusters, median number of countries that are involved in this particular clusters are around two countries per cluster. But if you look at the range, there are two to 10 countries that are involved in the clusters. And also, if you look at the number of isolates per cluster, then these are also around four isolates per cluster, but some clusters have a very large number of isolates. So we have a range from two to 226 isolates per cluster. And the most interesting thing is the median duration in which the cluster spans. So on an average, it spans around three years. But if you look, there are certainly some persisting clusters that are circulating for quite a longer period. For example, we have a range from zero to 15 years, for example, that a cluster is spanning. So every week for Listeria, we query all of these clusters, 661 clusters to EFSA database, um, including both the single country and multi-country clusters. So it is uh, relevant for the single country clusters also to subject to the EFSA query, because if there is a possible food match for these clusters, it is relevant for the national, um, um, for the countries as such. But also if there is a food match from the other countries, for example, it is particularly more relevant for the countries to know the possible food match from the other countries. 
So we have around 63 clusters that have um, non-human matches that are single country clusters, and around 65 clusters that have non-human matches for the multi-country clusters. So to show how the cluster visualization looks in the um, EpiPulse molecular typing tool, here I have chosen the example of a Salmonella Senftenberg cluster. Um, this is chosen because uh, ECC and EFSA recently produced a joint rapid outbreak assessment for this particular cluster. So um, the main kind of visualization that you see in EpiPulse molecular typing is a microreact visualization, where you have mainly like three different modules here, um, or panels, I would say. And the first panel is the map, where you could see um, on the left side, where you could see that um, um, regarding the reporting countries that are involved in this particular cluster, you can see in the map. And the main visualization is the phylogenetic tree, where you can see the relationship between these isolates. And then the third uh, panel is the timeline. You could see that um, uh, in what particular range that this cluster is spanning to. In this particular case, the, case, the cluster is spanning um, from 2022 to 2023, for example. And you can see the periodic submission of isolates for these cluster. Also, um, there is a lot of metadata that is associated with these isolates, and you can um, really label the isolates, color them, um, do a lot of mapping. For example, you can do um, the labeling by reporting country, for example, the color uh, by year use for statistics, and also, most importantly, sample origin. And also, additionally, for Salmonella, we also have in-house resistance prediction markers available. And in this example, you can see a quinolone markers that are also present here. So here the isolates are colored by the sample origin. There are 19 isolates that are present in this cluster from the human um, 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 side, whereas there is a one particular food match from the EFSA database that we got as a hit. And together you can view in the perspective of the overall um, human and the food isolates together in the visualization. So to conclude from both ECDC and EFSA side on the joint EFSA ECDC One Health system, it enables controlled and centralized data sharing. So we ensure data integrity, security, and also responsible chain of custody for sector specific information. And also it fosters multidisciplinary insights and collaborative outbreak responses and enables the cross sectorial collaboration. So also you can share the data while retaining the ownership of a data in a secured collaboration. And we also focus on the responsible data use with prioritizing accuracy, ethics, and regulations. And also we address the EU complexity by addressing diverse organizational structures and also taking into account national prioritizations. So for the operational efficiency, it's a swift outbreak response and also public health protection. Of course, we are constantly evolving. There is a room for further development and also input from data providers and users are always considered and taken into account. So on behalf of ECDC and EFSA, I would like to thank all the EU EEA member states and experts from these member states. And also there's a lot of experts involved from both ECDC and EFSA side for making this joint One Health system possible. So thank you to all of those. So thank you very much, Priyanka, and thanks to Mirko. And first of all, congratulations for the big work uh, done to implement this uh, very useful system to you and the agencies, of course, and all the people involved. Uh, so we are going to keep the question uh, for uh, the uh, question and answer session at the end. Uh, and I'm going to introduce now the uh, first speaker. Yes, Burkhard, please. Uh, Dr. Burkhard Malorny from uh, the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, the BFR in German, uh, in Germany, in uh, Berlin. Uh, he is a genomic microbiologist uh, uh, talking about the cross-sectoral implementation of the system in Germany. So uh, thank you, and please, the floor is yours, Burkhardt. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Um, and first of all, I would like also to thank um, EFSA for this kind invitation and to present now some experience we did in Germany with the establishment of a national One Health database. Um, so I have to say we have nothing finished. Um, so I just um, explain you a little bit what our way is and we hope that we will be successful. And it is a little bit also com complicated in Germany. And uh, my first slide will be 
to show uh, you a little bit how we analyze um, foodborne outbreaks in, in, uh, in Germany. And the competence of, of outbreak investigations is located on, on the local uh, authorities. So if there is some notifications, then this information is recorded um, via the lender public health authorities to the federal health authority, the Robert Koch Institute. This is done by law. And this information, if uh, foodborne outbreak diseases or, or notifications are involved, those informations are then also moved to the federal contact point by the Federal Office of Consumer Protection and Food Safety. And um, those information goes then, then back to the lender food safety authorities in case of cross-sectoral um, outbreaks and uh, also back to the local food safety authorities. Of course, food borne outbreaks could be also detected by consumer complaints about the food uh, safety um, side. So you see it's, it's a re really mutual um, exchange of information we have. We have on the one side reporting by law and on the one side information exchange, which is not by law. This is uh, freely possible. And um, now we're coming up to the subtyping of the, uh, this WGS, um, of the um, suspected isolate. So, um, in Germany, we analyze all outbreaks meanwhile with WGS, that's no question. But we have at the moment a really reactive system and we want to come to a proactive, proactive system. And in former times, we had um, the sequencing of the isolates were mainly uh, based by the National Reference Center at the Robert Koch Institute from the public health side and on the other side from the food side by the National Reference Laboratories located at the uh, BFR in Germany, in Berlin. And both um, laboratories has exchanged um, their um, sequence data and analyzed them and gave back the results to the authorities. Meanwhile, um, the lender has um, set it up more and more capacities and they started to sequence their own isolates on the lender level. So um, the National Reference Center and the laboratories even get any more those isolates but, um, and have no control anymore of all the isolates which are sequenced in Germany. So of course, then, oh sorry, of course then uh, we need a common database for exchanging those data. And uh, this is something we haven't right now and we are now setting up those data. Um, we have recognized the situation of course and our Ministry of Public Health and Ministry of Food and Agriculture started now a project team. They established a project team. This is a, a, a cross-sectional system uh, between public health and food safety where representatives are in from the federal authorities and from the lender authorities are involved and we keep the structure quite easy. This is operational since February of this year and um, we have a steering group where representatives of ministries are in and these are more or less the uh, decision makers, the pol political decision makers. And then we have two subgroups, subgroup one and two. And the one subgroup is uh, dealing with the ways um, of communication and coordination. Of course, we have already guidelines, but now to adapting to WGS, we have to refine the system. And the other subgroup is uh, responsible for uh, looking for technical possibilities, how we set up this database and what interfaces we need, for example, what system, what, what um, analyst types uh, we want to have. And those suggestions go then back to the steering co uh, uh, group and where the decisions are, de uh, are you, uh, done. So we, we like to be, come back from the reactive to a prospective or proactive management system. And uh, we decided also to start as EFSA with Salmonella enterica, Listeria monocytogenes, and um, Stiga toxin producing E. coli. And 
we of course uh, also considered or identified uh, a lot of challenges and uh, Stefano already talked about them. Um, it is a kind of repetition, but of course what we have for challenges is of course this a different legislatives we have on the food side and on the public health side. And there we have to come together with, especially with our metadata, of course. And um, what is also a challenge is the funding of the system. Of course, the system, if we set it up, costs money. How we fund it? We have the uh, federal, um, we have the federal, we have the lender level, we have the different sectors. So who is funding what? And this is something which is not so easy, and we are also sitting on that, but the willingness, the willingness to do it is there, and also to share data is there. So this is not the question to share data, but the question is how we share the data, and who can, uh, who can uh, have what access. And um, on the, yeah, especially on the lender um, laboratories, we have also some really IT infrastructure challenges. It, it sounds sometimes so easy um, to have to exchange data via the internet, but sometimes it's not so easy, <laughs> at least in Germany. Uh, for example, the um, laboratories have not the possibility to use Linux systems, for example, because they are not. Uh, um, prepared for that. So um, the laboratories have to prepare for Linux systems. Um, there is um, a very hard discussion in, in these groups about using clouds. So most of the lenders are not allowed to use clouds by, by, by any general reasons. Sometimes it's not to understand, but um, even at federal system, we are not allowed to use clouds, but we made the experience if you talk with the IT experts and with all the people and to explain why you need now clouds and so on and that they are secure more or less, then um, it comes more and more, the mind comes more and more open. So it's a lot of communication which has to be done there. And also the missing of qualified uh, staff is uh, still a matter. Um, so all these things together comes um, yeah, to discussions or to thinking how we shall organize it. So shall we do it more decentralized, this uh, um, system, or shall we organize it more centralized, this data generation? And then we come to a very general <laughs> discussion and, and decision we have to do also. Is it maybe easier to, um, to use pri pri uh, um, propriety software with knowing substantial deficits, but to set up very fast a system and to use it? Or is it more wise to take more time which is more time intensive and to de develop a um, system which is based on open, open source software. So it means license free. This is really a matter of discussion in our country. In that way, um, you see here this next, next slide and a kind of st a structure. I have to stress out that this is not uh, uh, finished or, or yeah, this is a proposal of maybe how a national, uh, national surveillance database can be, uh, can be structured. We have um, proposed by BFR. And I think it is maybe wise to start with a decentralized sequence data generation. I know a lot of countries use the centralized sequence data generation and this analysis. And of course, it's much, much more easier to do it centralized, no question. But then the laws comes and the fears, how we cannot, um, uh, we cannot give raw data to you because maybe you analyze it for other issues and so on. And we decided on that way to, um, to a decentralized system. So that means every country who is, or well, everyone who is um, doing um, raw data um, sequencing generation can also analyze their data decentrally with a certain kind of software, open source software. And um, we fully agree here with EFSA also that um, 
We analyze it, um, so we use the CG MLSD ID profiling decentralized, so Chewbacca would be that, that um, laboratories would be um, possible to use it on local level. But then, of course, there comes again laboratory to say, we don't have the capacities. So for those, ca uh, for those cases, we have some issues or we can use this, our German um, national bioinformatic cloud. This is the Denby cloud, which is also an open funding. And um, in this infrastructure, you get um, calculation engine for free, more or less. So it's, it's, it's uh, it, of course, it costs something, but um, it is paid by, the, uh, by, by our ministries. And the third way would be to go over the EFSA database to, uh, um, to create such CG MLST ID profiling. And by this CG, C, CG MLST profiling, you can only do CG MLST. So you don't see anything on that on antibiotic resistance or something like that. And those ID profiles will be generated de decentrally, but going then in a central typing database for a common, uh, um, for a common uh, CG MLST analysis. And on the other way, the metadata will be provided to these isolates, of course. And we will um, compute a, a front end and also a web interface report for, for, um, for an automation of the analysis of the data. And we look also very, um, so we have also an eye, of course, on the prioritization of clusters. So if you start sequencing salmonella, we know it from other research projects, and we have already also developed some bioinformatic tools we can use for prioritization of clusters. So it's an automated prioritization of clusters. If you start sequencing a lot of salmonella isolates, we like, of course, to do in a proactive way you find hundreds of clusters. And where you like to start to analyze it more uh, epidemi in an epidemiological way. So you need an automatic system, uh, which clusters comes in focus for analyzing. And um, this must be an automatic system behind that and something like that we want to program. So this is my last slide. Um, you see we are on the road. But we did not any. We didn't make any final decisions. Um, we um, this subgroups and so were already quite active this year, and we defined some system requirements we want to have some very general. And this this means, for example, that we want a Windows-based access system, no command line executions that we um, need workflows with really clear identifiers because many isolates maybe are sequenced in several times uh, and we need clear identifiers for that, that we don't, um, yeah, um, uh, yeah, that we can um, allocate them to the right outbreak and um, that we uh, want to have a CG, uh, schemes uh, which are completely compatible to the EFSA scheme and um, we, what is really important and what I really miss in these all this, um, discussions right now, but maybe this is the next step when we started the sequencing of uh, isolates in, in a more proactive way that we need an automatic identification and of matches and prioritization of clusters and uh, that we have then an easy front end for deployment of cluster information. Thank you, that was my contribution <laughs> from Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much, Burkhard. Yeah. Uh, very interesting to hear about German approach. Uh, yes, the questions will be at the end, so uh, I would ask uh, the next speaker, Dr. Lau Bagsen, uh, to, I'm welcoming you here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. is a, a food and veterinary microbiologist uh, from uh, the uh, National Food, uh, uh, food Institute uh, in Denmark, based at the DTU, the Univ Technical University of Denmark. Uh, so please, we are happy to hear about how you implemented the system in Denmark. Thank yes. you. And thank you, and thank you to EFSA and for the possibility to come and tell some examples on how we are doing it in Denmark. And I think 
having listened to you, Bernard, I think one step, uh, one important, um, uh, important message to say in, in the beginning is that we have a very long tradition, you will hear that, and that Denmark is actually a minor state than most of the lenders within Germany. So we, from that perspective, have another uh, out, another starting point. So, so when I uh, got this uh, invitation, it was for me quite a, a trip of memory lane because actually we have had a long uh, tradition in cross-sectional collaboration in Denmark regarding outbreak investigations long before it called One Health. We mentioned it as from, from farm to fork approach. And uh, back in 1993, we had a big outbreak. At that time, there was actually a, a battle in the news between the human side and the food and veterinary side. And it was really much up in the press, and it was very clear after that that it was necessary to build up collaboration, to build up trust between those sectors in order to be able to, to handle these kind of, of crises, these kind of situations. So back in the last millennium, we actually established the Danish Zoonosis Center, and we established a group called the Central Management Outbreak Group. And it worked. And it worked. Of course, there was a lot of outbreaks that we were not able to succeed with, but a lot of crises were actually managed within this collaboration. But in 2008 and 9, we again had a very high number of salmonella cases. We had a very big outbreak. And at that time, there was a more focusing on how could we actually strengthen this group? How could we prioritize? How could we make it more, even more effectful? And, and there was an evaluation at that time which put a lot of focus in on actually making more clear rules of, on roles and responsibilities and procedures. And there was also a focus on saying, okay, it should not be only a working group, it should actually also have a, a high support from the management level. Uh, so back in 99, there was an evaluation, uh, which was actually done by the Danish Emergency Management Agency. And, and based on that, we took even more effort in order to support the cross-sectional work. We made a steering group. We made more focus on the administrative tools and the tools of communication and so on. And actually, you can see that a part of that uh, conclusion at that time in 2009 was that we should work more actively within EU in order to promote uh, surveillance and outbreak response. This is uh, to show where this central outbreak management group is situated in, 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 the, in the field of Ministry of Health, Minister of Food, Agriculture, Fisheries in Denmark, and then Ministry of Higher Education and Science. And when higher education and science is included in this, it is because uh, the Technical University of Denmark, where the National Food Institute is placed, is under this ministry. But you can see that there is full uh, support from, from the ministries. And then, of course, there is some collaboration with, with other uh, stakeholders in the country. But it is these three ministries that have the main, out, uh, the main work. OK, today we still have such a, a central management outreach group in order to, to ensure that we have an effective and, and a very coordinated effort from all parties to handle these uh, outbreaks and food and waterborne disease. And, and every Tuesday they, they meet, either physically or, or virtual. And, and the small group is consistent of a representative from State and Serum Institute, which is the human part, the Danish Veterinary and Food Administration, which is the authorities, and the National Food <coughs> Institute. And it's important to say that the representatives within this group are coming from their own institution, and they are working on the mandate from their own institution. The group do not have any legal uh, power in its own. So they have to work, they have to find out, they have to collaborate, and then they have to go back in their own institutions. Of course, when we started back in, in the last century, we didn't have full genome sequencing. We work with uh, phenotypical typing method, and we have followed the, all the, uh, the following way up uh, through all the kind of molecular typing method coming. But our background, our collaboration is the same. 
So now we are looking much more into data. And we also share data long before these, but we share them based on trust and based on collaboration between colleagues and different institutions. And uh, actually that was very easy and very clear. And we built up a good uh, system for this. And now during the last five, 10 years, there have been more and more rules, more and more legislation that of course says, okay, now we should try to follow the right rules and the right re legislation and still be able to work as efficient and as trustful as we did before. And that's actually quite a, a, a task to do. But of course, we look into data. And, and it's very important to say again here that the human data, which is a part of this collaboration, is owned by State and Serum Institute, whereas the veterinary and food data is owned by the Danish Veterinary and Food Administration. Our mandate at the National Food Institute is coming from the Ministry of Food, Fish and Agriculture because we, are, we, have, a, we have a contract with, with the ministry to, to give uh, science-based advice to the uh, food and veterinary authorities. So we have this ownership that's fine, and we have at least two kinds of, of uh, databases which are accessible for all of this. There's a food and water-based outbreak database which describes the, the outbreak is registered throughout Denmark. And, and here uh, it is Stan Serum Institute and the authorities, the food and veterinary authorities that put in the data, but we have access to it. Uh, so this is description of the outbreak, so to say. And then we have the selected data, which is VGS data and uh, metadata, which is stored in a shared database. And this is one of the really important breakthrough in the last years that we have been able to make this short database, which is a closed and secured environment where SSI and uh, DVFA has shared data responsibility. So they have defined that they have shared data responsibility within this closed uh, and secured uh, environment. And we have access to this. So this is more or less to try to say that we have this shared computer room and where we put in information from all the actors and where we share it for, for comparison and, and in the future more and more also for analysis in order to have the the, the uh, biotechnical, the bioinformatic analysis within the shared environment as well. Okay, but one thing was that we were able to have this collaboration during many years based on trust and, and good colleagues. Nowadays, we have to have it described in, in agreements. And therefore, there have been developed uh, data processing agreements between the Food and Veterinary Authorities State and Serum Institute and the National Food Institute. And it's especially regarding how we at DTU Food are able to assess and analyze and communicate with, on these human data that we work together with from the human side. How to do that and how to describe that. And, and that is described in a procedure that has been developed through the, you know, between the organization. And in this regarding food, which was the description of the outbreak, it is specifically mentioned that we have to report to EFSA on food outbreaks. So we have one uh, data processing agreement on this food, and we have another uh, data processing agreement between State and Serum Institute and DTU Food that's described how we can work with the data within this secured environment where SSI and uh, DVFA uh, share their data, how we can work with that uh, that is also described in a specific uh, agreement. So these is two uh, really important data processing agreements that have been developed through the last two, three, four, five years. It has taken much more time than we actually thought it would take. But when we sit together as microbiologists, we say, this is this making sense. But then there come lawyers from, from both institutions, and then it's not so easy anymore. But we have managed to do it. We also working a lot of these of collaboration agreements, and DTU has a collaboration agreement or a contract, actually, a strategic framework agreement with the Ministry of Food, Fish, and Agriculture, which give us the mandate to serve as a scientific advisor to the food and veterinary authorities. So therefore, we have an, a, a formal agreement on that level. 
And in addition to that, we are right now discussing the need for an additional collaboration agreement between all those members that work within these uh, central management outbreak groups, because it seems that those things we have made years ago are not covering all of what is legally necessary right now. So what we are, we are discussing the need for further uh, collaboration agreement. We are working together uh, as we have done for many years, and this just to show that we actually within the framework on the One Health ETP uh, program also have had a, an exercise because it's really important that those people that work together here, they also know each other and that they know what is important from the different stakeholders because we have different perspectives, whether we are coming from the human side or whether we are coming from food and veterinary side. And we have to understand it others. And I think it's very good with all the, the legal framework and all the uh, agreements but the most important thing is that it will only work when people know each other and understand that we have different perspectives. So therefore, this exercise was very good. So this was what we do in Denmark. But of course, Denmark is a, a part of the EU and also a part of the global society in general. So when we look into our collaboration within EU, then it's really clear that SSI, the State and Serum Institute, are responsible for collaboration with ECDC, whereas uh, uh, veterinary food authorities and the National Food Institute is responsible for the collaboration with and reporting to EFSA. And here again, uh, the Danish uh, Food and Veterinary Administration have given DTU a mandate to be acting as country officer uh, within this subgroup of zone and network. So we are those who actually, on behalf of the authorities, submit data uh, to the official EFSA system. Right now we have discussed, and we have discussed that for many years, the possibility to, to upload our national data to, to a global database. And we are not doing that due to a lot of those discussions that is already mentioned here. But of course, we are also a research institution, and when we are making research, we are in a situation where data are published uh, as a part of uh, scientific publication, and, and there we, of course, share them in, in an anonymous uh, way. Okay, future perspective. Uh, of course, we would like to expand uh, the full genome sequencing much more, and we would like the collaboration of, of sharing data to include even more isolates and, and uh, uh, yeah, other things. We also very much like to include more isolates and it could be an idea to, to look into private industry. I do not think that will be very easy, but it could be nice. Uh, but what we really want to do is, is to improve the systems uh, in order to make it easier to upload bigger amount of data and in a more um, easy way, because as, as we see it right now, it's quite workload to, to upload data to the, to the EFSA systems. So here we have an, an idea that we really want to to expand it, to, to go into to these kinds of, of things. And then, as several have mentioned, we would also very much like to go to from a more retrospective, a more reactive system to be more proactivity and go into more preparedness and, and prevention. But uh, um, being able to do that, it should be much easier for us to upload bigger amount of, of uh, data, both the sequence data and the metadata. And then, just finalizing, we have discussed through the year a lot of opportunity to, to collaborate and to build up a, 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 a cross-member state work uh, on these issues because we think that if we work together, we will be stronger. Uh, until now, it has been mostly ideas because none of us have really had all the energy to, to go more into it. But again, a meeting like this, an opportunity to discuss across will be really helpful and uh, we really look to look forward to be a part of that journey also in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorte. So now it's time to move to uh, the last speaker. So Karin Lagesen, please uh, 
You're welcome on the floor. Uh, Karin is a bioinformatician working at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. So when you're ready, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for EFSA for inviting me uh, so I can speak about the activities that we have ongoing at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. So, uh, just a few things, a few words about me. I'm half, a, half and half a microbiologist, uh, molecular biologist, molecular biologist, correction, and computer scientist. So this is coming from uh, a, a very bioinformatics point of view. So first, a bit about the institute that I worked about, work at. So the areas covered by the dashes here. That's the areas we work in. So we pick up when the animals start to eat the food. So we concern ourselves with the food that the animals eat. Uh, the animals themselves, and we also believe that fish are animals in this connection. And also the food that people eat. And this is where we cross over to uh, the public health sector. The systems I'm going to be telling you about today, uh, it's the civil systems that we've built up at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. We do not currently yet uh, have uh, human sequencing data in the system. And there's lots of reasons for this, but one of them is that it's simply difficult for the human side to let the sequencing data them they have outside of the building at the moment. So, but that is a goal for us to do a lot more collaboration with them also on a very practical level. So, first a bit of history. Uh, the Norwegian, Bi uh, Norwegian Veterinary Institute, we started building up bioinformatics capacity and competence at the Institute in the early 2010s. And in 2018 and 2019, we got two large projects, which enabled us to really fast forward this process. And the first project was the Orion project. So this is one of the One Health EJP projects that I think many of you know about. Uh, and the second was uh, an NFR funded, a Norwegian Research Council founded funded project called SecTech, which basically focused on the implementation of sequencing data and in infrastructure at the Institute. And in this talk, the primary foc focus is going to be on this e infrastructure that we've built. And today, as we speak, uh, the sequencing infrastructure that we've built is being incorporated into the digital strategy at the Institute. So just to clear the next, what kind of analysis are we actually doing with the system that we've built and worked up? Uh, we're currently primarily focused on bacterial genomes. Uh, that's all first and foremost because we have to start somewhere. Uh, we are going to viruses uh, fairly soon, but we have to eat our cake one piece at a time. And when it comes to analysis, we're primarily focusing on two different kinds of types. First one is characterization studies. And this is single isolate uh, studies uh, where we look at one isolate, which resistance genes does it have, which sequence type is it, this kind of information. The second type of analysis is clustering analysis, where we compare isolates and try to see if they, how similar they are. And as you know, this is the primary uh, driver when we are uh, trying to look at outbreaks and figure outbreaks out. We also have quite a lot of focus on surveillance in this context, because this has a large impact on how you set up systems and how you organize your data. Uh, because if you want to do surveillance, you need to make sure that the results you have are actually comparable across time. Uh, and this is opposed to what you have if you're working on diagnostics bioinformatics or project-based, because then your data just has to be comparable with what you're looking at right then and there. So this is an overview over the systems that we've built up. And we have two sides here. Uh, on the left side, you will see the laboratory side, uh, where we have the laboratory man management information systems. We have the sequencing machines. And we have the in-house servers to uh, produce the sequencing data. And on the right side, we have the bioinformatics analysis platform that we've uh, set up. 
And the crossing point between those two systems is where we move the sequencing data from the in-house systems to the uh, bioinformatics analysis platform. So what is actually the things that we're getting when we're putting up this kind of a system? So on this row here, we have the basic functions that we, we think are really needed in this kind of a system. First, people need to be able to submit their samples. Uh, and we then need to be able to track the samples in the laboratory uh, system. We need to know what's happening to them and where they are. And then we need to be able to do the sequencing and uh, produce the sequencing files. Next, we need compute to be able to do both the demultiplexing itself, the producing of the sequencing files, but also for the analysis, because a lot of this is computational intensive. We also need a workflow engine. So this is something that can run the bioinformatics analysis, the pipelines, because they usually consist of many tools stacked on top of each other. And we also need something to make sure that the runs are actually going OK. Uh, so we don't actually have to check every single one of them. We need to be able to store the raw sequencing data and uh, the uh, metadata, information about the samples the results that we produce, and we also need a way of interacting with this kind of system. So how do the components that we've put up, to get, uh, put up uh, correspond to this? The first parts uh, of the system, uh, a main driver here is uh, the Clarity Laboratory Information Management System. Uh, so this is an Illumina produced and hosted uh, LIMS system uh, that's actually running on servers in Germany. And this allows the people working in the lab to track the samples. They know what's happening to them. They know what's going on. And this picture here shows uh, the isolates we ha currently have going through the system. And it shows the operators where they can go in and, and what they can do uh, with the samples. And they can also go into these steps and figure out uh, what needs to be done on each step. Uh, we, it also allows for uh, people to submit their sequences. So this is the actual sheet that we use to submit the sequences into the, the isolates into the system. And it allows people to see where their samples are in the process. On the bioinformatics analysis side, we have chosen the system that's called IRIDA, produced by the Canadian health authorities and a lot of other people. This system gives us primarily two huge benefits uh, for us. For us. First and foremost, it gives us very good control over the data. Uh, and uh, it also gives us the options of creating our own pipelines, our own analysis. Uh, so this is an example of what it looks like when you go into one of these projects and look at your data. You see all of the isolates. Uh, you see when they were uploaded into the system. You see some of the results and the quality scores. And this gives you the information you need to uh, process the, the data. And as I mentioned, uh, it also allows us to create our own pipelines. These are some of the pipelines that we have created ourselves. It also comes with some pipelines. The first one, the assembly and annotation pipeline, is for the most part uh, pre-made by the Eureka people. So if we go back to this image, this is how each of these components really map uh, from what the, the software you, we're using and uh, the functions they perform. And uh, this is maybe something that you recognize. Uh, you raised the question of uh, commercial software versus uh, open license things. Um, I just want to emphasize that, that in our experience, no matter, no, no, uh, almost no matter what you buy, uh, you need people to work with them and to figure out how to use them in your local context. Very few things will actually just be like Word, because this doesn't work like Word. Uh, why have we chosen to do it like this? 
And the issue here we came back to was, uh, it, it boils down to who is actually doing the analysis. And we figured out that there are really two models for how this works. And the first model we could call the core facility model. And this is something that you're probably very familiar with. This is the situation where the bioinformatics people run the analysis and gives a static report to the people, uh, to the domain experts, those who know STEC, Salmonella very intimately. And if they want to know something more, they then have to ask the bioinformaticians to do more analysis. The second model, which is what we have chosen to go with, is more the domain expert model. And this is where the bioinformaticians, instead of running analysis, they create analysis. They create pipelines. And then the domain experts can themselves go in and they can ask their own questions of the data. And we believe that this gives the domain experts and the bioinformaticians leave to do what they do best. Uh, however, this means that training becomes paramount. Because if you give this kind of a result to somebody who's never interacted with sequencing data before, they're going to go like, yeah, short, sure, this is fine. But with some training and more information, and if you make sure that they actually have the data that they need to evaluate results, maybe they will start questioning what they see. So maybe, okay, this is ST35, but it shows signs of contamination. Uh, the genome that has been assembled is in a lot of pieces. Maybe you shouldn't call an outbreak based on this kind of information. Maybe you should send this back for resequencing and see what, what's going on. And this raises another question and the issue for me. Uh, in many contexts, when, when sequencing and bioinformatics analysis is presented, this is the kind of a view that is being shown. You have four boxes on the lab stuff and one box for the bioinformatics stuff. When in reality, if you look at it truly, the bioinformatics stuff is just as complex. Uh, and this last item for me highlights that sequencing is really a circle. Because the bioinformatics stuff you do depends on what, uh, what happens in the lab. What, uh, how are your samples being processed? But how your lab samples are being processed should uh, be, ter be, ter be determined based on what analysis you want done. And this brings my last point, there has to be a whole lot of talking by cross people uh, involved in the entire, entire process. You need uh, bacteriologists, uh, IT people, bioinformaticians, you need the full gamut of people to talk and learn from each other so that this uh, the information gets spread between all of them. And last but not least, this is the people I work with. So this is my group of people that I talk a lot to. And as you see, we have lab people, bioinformaticians, uh, programmers, uh, Linux people, all of them. And they are all deeply needed. And that was it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karin. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the speakers for being in time. So thank you. So it's uh, time now to open the question and answer session. So I would like to welcome back all the speakers of this session on the floor. So uh, the uh, Slido application is going to be open or is as right as just now has been uh, open for posting your questions from remotely. Uh, we are going to organize uh, the session here, so maybe we can put some chairs on the stage. Yes, thanks. So we have heard about uh, a lot of interesting discussion points, um, and uh, I think it's very... <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> just a bit of noise. We are missing just one chair. 
Okay, I think um, we have heard about the main uh, points uh, that um, I mean are going to be dealt in this uh, in this um, conference. So uh, the use of closed systems, the use of uh, in-house pipelines, uh, uh, the difficult the difficulty of uh, exchanging data and of trusting uh, and of using the right legal framework. Uh, so, um, I would like, first of all, to hear the audience uh, and see if there are questions. Oh, yes, there is already one. So, we will start from the audience, but be sure, those participating online, that we are considering all your questions. So, please. Thank you. My name is Nico van Belsen from Science Consult. I'm an old guy, so I, I don't understand this QA thing. I hope I can uh, ask a question the old-fashioned way. Uh, basically, two questions. Uh, and having to do with the use of the data beyond the, um, the looking for pathogens in, uh, in traceability. Basically, already mentioned by some of the speakers, uh, surveillance, being prepared, looking for AMR sequences, for instance, in the whole data set we have, um, without an actual outbreak or something like that. How will that work in practice? Okay, I suppose the EFSA st staff can do it, ECDC staff can do it, but if I'm an academic scientist and I say, well, this beautiful data set, can I use that to look for AMR sequences? Or if the WHO comes and says, uh, we are the WHO, uh, we would like to, to use your database for, for sequences. Is that possible? That's my first question. I guess this is for Mirko, yeah. <laughs> I guess this question for us. Um, not directly through us. This data set is designed, the, the system and so, and so forth, the database is designed for a specific scope. The people involved, the network have been nominated for sharing data on a specific scope, which actually is uh, tracking foodborne outbreak uh, and performing uh, uh, cluster detection. So what we, if you come to me and say, can I access the system? I will just kindly uh, forward you to go to the data, to the data owner, which actually are the one that has the data, uh, uh, so the member states. So I will just direct you to the original data owner. Our system is sort of a, a place where data temporarily arrive uh, for performing specific action. And the action is uh, clearly on our collaboration agreement with the CC and our interaction with the member states. What says that, I just want to, and then I pass to CC. We always encourage our member state to share data in a public domain, where actually that is a data, is a place where you should look for, for the data for a research perspective. We, we don't want to substitute uh, what actually ANA and CBI and, and the Japanese database is, that is what they are designed for. Our is just a, a moment where data need, need to be shared and if they need to be shared in a private set setting, it's possible for an operational point of view. So for the support in the outbreak detection investigation at EU level. So maybe. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, hello. hello. So from the ECDC point of view, um, not only in terms of an outbreak or in terms of a um, specific event, this data is also used, um, for example, for the AMR um, consortium. For example, we regula regularly um, analyze the data. But in, in your specific question, do we have access outside, I mean, for the academia, for example? Um, according to the EU legislation, there is a possibility that test data can be shared in a cases where there is a valid uh, research question, for example. So there is an application for this, for the data access, and if there is a valid uh, reason um, for the data uh, access, then definitely this data can be shared in an aggregated form for the AMR analysis, for example. Thank you. May I have another question, please? I think if so. If I put my different hat on, in the I, so. I have a beautiful factory producing yogurts, for instance. There is an outbreak. I'm a responsible person. So I'll, I allow the uh, authorities to sample in my factory all the different steps of the process. They look for the, they sequence all of that. Okay, no pathogen. Okay, fine. But now my sensitive details of my production process, which element is added at what time is in this database. How can I be assured that my competitors will not get the hands on it? I saw some of the slides today, Windows-based systems full of holes. I mean, how can, how can I be assured as a company that my data is really protected? Thank you. I guess I 
I can answer from a European perspective, but maybe you, Denmark and, and Norway can answer from their perspective. So um, the type of data we are collecting uh, and the metadata we are collecting uh, uh, is very minimal and we not uh, include uh, any information that you were pointing out now. So uh, saying that, um, I would say that the data, we are not interacting directly with the industry, we interact with the food authorities, the food authorities take responsibility to understand which type of data they can share at our level. Uh, say that, uh, for example, in our specific setting, uh, uh, the data that that the authority uh, give to us with the detailed information is visible, visible only to the authority itself. And what the data we are sharing is even a subset of the metadata we're actually asking. So uh, meaning that we are protecting the flow by just uh, ensuring that all the uh, very specific and minimal information are shared on the moment uh, is needed. Maybe other they can support. Yeah, I really, I, I understand that you said that there were no uh, pathogens identified. Yeah, yeah, but, but, what we, but what we are sharing is pathogens from the of identified in the official control of food. So there will be no sharing if there's no pathogen. That is one thing. And the other thing is, as, as Mirko already said, that, that the metadata is very, very, very limited. So it will be the country uh, and the year and whether it is uh, in the food sector or in the human sector that is there. And, and then I, the idea is that then you will maybe, if you are in a, in a, in a uh, follow up on an outbreak, you will be able to go to that country and discuss with the uh, country officer on how to get contact to the authorities and get improved. So it is very close. Yeah. Um, yeah, in Germany it's uh, similar. So uh, we share not really sensitive metadata. That means uh, companies' names, um, patients, something like that. We don't share at all for such a database. And this information who uh, have this info uh, or the authorities are um, on local level who have this sensitive um, data. And they are responsible also, of course, then for the management of the outbreak. So there comes once <laughs> the, 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 the time where they look more deeper, maybe if they have suspected cases or so in the, in the food um, companies and so on. But um, for all other authorities who are involved in the database, in this data management um, sharing system, they even don't have this information. So this sensitive information is only on the local authorities who has to manage this, the outbreak. So it's not shared. <laughs> okay. Another comment, Mirko? Yes. Yeah. Maybe you are, may I, maybe you might ask. And then when we have an outbreak at your level, so this information is useful. So how can you track to the factory that we need to, to manage? No? So maybe, so w when there is an outbreak, where the data is located that we help the manager to track. But this is not coming to our system. There is a specific system at the European level, which is a RAS system, which is designed for sharing this specific information across food sector, uh, uh, within the food sector. And that is a system that uh, where the data is located, the type of data you were mentioned, is shared under specific regulation and is, for example, used uh, by FCCDC during a rapid outbreak assessment on a specific uh, mandate on, on the European Commission. So it's not say that we do not collect, we do not collect systematic data, but when it's needed, uh, we know where the data is located. Uh, we know who are actually the owner of the data in that specific occasion, we might share the information for the specific objective of uh, assessment uh, the specific outbreak. Thank you. So, other questions from the audience? I can see a hand. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Would Anthony you please Wilson. introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. Anthony please. Wilson, UK Food Standards Agency. Okay. Um, it's possibly a slightly broader question than this specific topic, but uh, what we've seen in these talks has been some very, or some moderately complicated networks of collaboration and data sharing. Um, which is is essential for the for the problem for the challenge, but also feels like there's a lot of potential points where capability can be lost through normal staff turnover, or and you need to maintain the quality of the inputs at every stage. 
Have you, can, would you like to talk about any lessons you've learned in maintaining capability across complex networks for this sort of problems? Please start. I, I can start uh, saying that one of the things I mentioned was that we have participated in an exercise across the, the complicated network in Denmark. And there we actually discussed a lot that even though we have this long tradition and even though we have a very good storytelling about we have done this in Denmark for years and years, we also recognize that it is important to, to train people and to welcome new people within the, society, within the, the network. Um, and we actually discussed that it may be more important also to write up some procedures, not in, or, not in order to be very strict in, in, in that way, but in order to ensure that we in, in the time, over time, involve new people, and we can see that, and that's of course, but, but having a structure for doing it will help, and it is really important because things are changing, and it's changing quicker and quicker uh, in this kind of work. Yeah, please come. Um, I just want to add, I really concur about documentation. Write stuff down. Uh, the worst part people to collaborate with is yourself six months ago. <laughs> Uh, the second thing I would like to add is uh, be careful, be, uh, build the teams of people uh, and uh, build in time for people to talk about what they do and why they do it and how things work. Uh, because being this kind of talking, these kinds of uh, communication means building your own mental model, helping other people understand how uh, the stuff you do actually works. And uh, building teams, first of all, it spreads knowledge within the team. And also, it does also lower uh, team turnover because people feel they have other people to pull on. Um, maybe also one uh, hint uh, from Germany. We have in Germany we have a harmonization or validation working group for um, validation of um, next generation or whole genome sequencing data, and we did it in um, yeah very uh, common um, ring trials with a lot of laboratories. And all the, for example, lender laboratories who sequencing the data in Germany and from, from the federal government, the authorities are involved in those groups. So we have really right now a good picture. What is a good quality of a sequence and where are the bottlenecks with the different techniques? And uh, we also um, published those data. It's uh, right now in the <laughs> review process, um, uh, just a hint. And um, it is really, I just, my summary is really on this experience is that um, you really have to take care of the uh, uh, data quality of the sequences because otherwise you can get really in trouble in, in the interpretation of the data. So you need really good quality parameters where you uh, you can trust that the quality is okay. Thank you. I've been told there are already questions uh, from the Slido audience. So. No, no, no. Okay. No, okay. I think it works. Yes, Valentina. So there are many questions. So we have just selecting some and then uh, maybe I post two related to the functionality of the system and then we go on with the others. The first one is regarding a cluster analysis. So the topic of clustering has come up a few times. Which tools algorithm are used for clustering? Is it clustering only perform on CG, uh, core genome MLST results? So this is one, and maybe also I pose the other one, which is, can the FCICDC databases pull data from ENA and CBI for analysis to save workload? Would it be possible to push data to ENA and CBI if the data uploader permits it? So, yeah. Okay, this is for Mirko and Priyanka, I guess. Yeah, I guess the cluster analysis is for 
Priya. Yes, um, I will take the first question regarding the cluster analysis. So currently, um, the core cluster is defined for different pathogens depending on um, um, how the class, I mean, how the how close the pathogens are related. For example, for listeria, we are using for a core cluster within four um, CG allelic differences. So everything that is within that particular threshold is considered as a core cluster. But we also have a possibility to look in epipulse molecular typing for an extended cluster until seven allelic differences, for example. So you can look into a context of a little bit much broader than um, what the core cluster is. For example, for food isolates, um, we agreed that um, until 780, uh, if a food isolate is close enough there, it will be included as a part of the cluster. So we have a slightly higher threshold for the food isolates. But also, when you upload your isolates to ECDC database, you also have a possibility, you don't have to go back to the clusters and look for the already predefined clusters. You can look at your isolate, select your isolate, and then extend like a distance threshold that you particularly want to visit um, to view yourself. Set a, set a threshold yourself, and you can look in a much broader context of your particular isolate and in context to the, um, the other closest human and food isolates as well. Thank you. Yeah, and from the food point of view, um, yeah, it's important to know that for us, we are agnostic on cluster definition. So it's a remit of ECDC decide what is a cluster to be investigated. So uh, we are collecting information from ECDC every week uh, um, uh, on a matching, possible matching of specific cluster, and we are monitoring that. But we do not perform clusters ourselves. We are show uh, the result of the interaction Mm, showing up a minimum spanning trees, as, as you probably know, is not a cluster analysis. You can then interact in, on the minimum spanning thing as, like, uh, as, as much as you like, but we do not uh, um, interpret a cluster on top uh, of what ACDC is doing. Uh, answering from the, food, um, from the food perspective on CBI and ENA, we can pull data from ENA and CBI. Actually, there is one of my slides that was a little bit quicker. We collect uh, in one year approximately uh, 1,500 data from member states, but we do it on a routine basis, on a weekly basis, uh, risk-based uh, uh, pulling data from ENA and CBI based on specific outbreak that we need to investigate it. Uh, we are doing that. Uh, we have discussed with uh, our network of uh, data providers, uh, if we can be a broker for pushing data also to uh, NICBI, this is, uh, uh, is our list to do in the future. And um, not at the moment, so at the moment, uh, you cannot push data from our system to NCBI, uh, but it's actually to the, to the list. Uh, and just for answer, again, a question about uh, how we can handle these collaborations uh, we can end it because uh, ECDC is actually speaking every week. So we, as very similar to Danish, we, we met not Thursday morning, we met Thursday afternoon uh, every week. Um, after the cluster analysis performed, we uh, evaluate every single event. Uh, and this is one of the parts of the collaboration. Second part, very important, we are working very closely, very deeply with our data provider, with our networks to try to improve uh, and uh, and maintain the, the knowledge and transfer the knowledge across the time. Yeah, um, regarding the INA and NCBI submissions, of course, ECDC also encourages countries to submit the data in the public domain, and we have a possibility so they can share those identifiers just, I mean, so that to reduce their extra work, they don't have to resubmit the reads to us. And we have a possibility to uh, fetch the data from the public domain. Okay, and about the algorithms used, uh, core genome MLST is used, right, uh, yes. to generate the trees. Just to answer about yes, that. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Other questions? I think we have many. So many questions from we slides. Have many. <laughs> we are just trying to select maybe some question to clarify because maybe some concepts are not completely clear. One regarding the FCCDC system platform. Did I understand correctly that there is no common database where the data is stored, but instead work with mutual queries? Just to clarify this point. And maybe just to pose the next one. Why creating a new system not using global databases like Genome Tracker? Yeah, over to you. Okay, second question. Uh, I will start from the first question, then thinking Good. about how to answer the second <laughs> question. Take your time. Um, so, um, yes, um, we have to separate uh, segregated uh, databases. They are not uh, 
they're independent uh, yeah. uh, from every, everything from IT perspective, business continuity, data collection, identity management, everything, we are independent. Uh, the two databases have been uh, interacted through, are interconnected to an API, which is seamless interacting between the two system and automatic perform exchange in base of specific rules that uh, we agree upon and we can control in our database. Uh, this is happening uh, seamless, as I show in my presentation. We, we actually share constantly data, uh, but the data is shared only on the specific circumstances. So under specific, uh, if the data answers specific question, like uh, I have a cluster of a five listeria human, do you have something in your database at five or seven lay distance or to any of these cluster? If there is yes, then we transfer the data. If there is no, we don't transfer any data. The data is transferred on a weekly basis. So practically, if the week after the data provider cancels the data from our system, when the ECDC will query us this data doesn't exist anymore, so we'll overwrite the data in the system in ECDC, meaning that our data provider have a con con complete control of what actually during that week time uh, ECDC, the public as counterpart can see. Uh, of course, that never happened that people would cancel data, but that is a, a just to let you know understanding. We offer a service, we do not own the data actually we are collecting. The service is designed only for a specific scope. Answer second, second question. It's very complicated to answer a second question. The, I, th I think that after a long discussion with the CDCFSA, with our member states, we just found out uh, uh, that we need a, an additional level of complexity that Genome Tracker was not uh, possible, able to uh, address. We, so our system was, is not uh, in, in contrast with the Genome Tracker uh, philosophy. And in addition is that we actually pull data from Genome Tracker on a daily basis. We are just needed to have uh, an additional level of uh, complexity to address the complexity of the European Union and how the data uh, is, is shared and especially how we able to track the uh, respons chain responsibility of the data, especially in the moment that we need to use the data for outbreak assessment investigation. Um. I will add slightly to the second question um, regarding in the strategic ECDC strategic framework document. So there's technical um, options provided in regarding the models that ECDC might employ regarding the establishing this um, centralized genomic uh, molecular surveillance system. So in this, there's um, proposed like um, kind of like in-house data model. So the first one that you are seeing that I presented today with submitting the data to TESC and EpiPulse, for example, and visualizing it and also comparing with ECDC FSA One Health system. But we also has proposed a second model depending on pathogen, for example. There is um, other model like for Neisseria meningitidis. We are currently employing a model where we have a database located at Oxford, um, where we have a private secured um, project folders at um, PubMLSD, which is called Emert2. And then um, the data is interacted there because the schemas and then the community is used to that particular um, the database. So, so that we don't have to develop a completely new thing with starting from a new schemas and everything. So depending on a pathogen and depending on availability, the various models were discussed with the research, with the communities as well, and um, eventually being proposed. Thank you. So are there are other questions from the audience. Yes, I can see George. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. George Haringhuizen from National Institute of Public Health of the Netherlands. Um, I have a question about source tracing, I think, primarily for uh, Karin and for Burkhardt. Um, if you, on the human side, detect a cluster on national level, either together with ECDC or just on a national level, how efficient can you go back to uh, the uh, patients for putting questionnaires on them if you, there is no clue whatsoever where to look for in the food chain? I've seen quite complex collaboration systems. How efficient can you go back? How fast? Thank you. Yeah, uh, very short for Germany. Um, this um, epidemiological investigations in larger outbreaks. Um, uh, uh, so the patients' interviews and so going on then are uh, performed by the Robert Koch Institute, uh, the federal authority in Germany and 
Yeah, it is too efficient. So there is an um, outbreak team, epidemiological outbreak team who, who uh, do the interviews and we have the possibilities to do it. And of course, how efficient they are, it depends also, of course, of the patients, how they, if they can remember and so on. So um, we have the system to do it, but it is only decided for larger outbreaks, I think. And my question is, uh, but do you have in the lab where you do your analysis in your sequence, you have a marker for which patient that directly turns back to the patient uh, that needs to be questioned? Um, maybe I will take over this question to Sandra from the Robert Koch Institute. <laughs> she's mm -hmm. in the audience and <laughs> do you have yes. a microphone? Yeah. Because yeah, she's working uh, daily with this situation. <laughs> Thanks. I think it's on. Yeah, okay. Now it's on. So my name is Sandra Simon from the Robert Koch Institute, but I'm on the laboratory part, so not from the epidemiologic part, but um, it's so the, the responsibility for these outbreak investigations is, as Bokart already said, on the local level. And only if it is, um, if more than one federal state are involved, then the federal states ask the RKI to, to take over the, um, the interviews. And the, but then we, the RKA has to go back to the local authorities and they need to, um, to collect a consent from the patients uh, to interview them. And uh, it can be that not every patient is willing to give this interview. But uh, when patients give these interviews, then these data are collected at the epidemiological department at RKI. <coughs> Sorry, um, and then they try to um, to to have an hypothesis on on the food item, and then they can go back um, to the to the food safety side on the also on the local authority. So it's very very complicated, and there is a lot of time um, time span uh, until you get if you get any results about it. So even in the, on the local level, it can be tricky, but networking is the, the key, I, I feel. So another question from the audience, Stefan? Uh, sorry, there is another yeah, comment. Yes, Karin, please. Uh, well, I'll, I'm on the food and vet side and on the bioinformatics side, so I don't really interact with the, uh, so much with this process, but from what I've seen uh, from the Public Health Institute uh, who initiate a lot of this, uh, the process is they, they have very good track of which isolates are from which patient. And uh, they collaborate tightly with the Norwegian Food Safety Authority and with us. So we have a very good communication on, on these issues. Okay, thank you. So I could see there, there was a question from Stefano. Uh, <clears throat> oops, thank you very much. Um, Stefano Morabito from the audience uh, <laughs> that is not present here in the room. Uh, the question is mainly pointing at Mirko and Priyanka, but it's of course open to all the speakers. And it's related to the dichotomy, open data versus fake data. I mean, Mirko, you say that EFSA is encouraging the data provider to uh, upload the data in the public domain to make them open for uh, you know, any use. But any researcher knows that the data in the public domain are not always usable for a sound and meaning uh, <clears throat> analysis and to build knowledge because the public domain is mostly fragmented and the data themselves are not complete, they're not verified and whatever. So the point is, why not thinking of making the data that you are collecting in your databases, which are verified, controlled and whatever, Fair. That means providing a controlled access, for instance, for the academia or to uh, other research institutions for, you know, specific pieces of research so in order to build more knowledge to improve the further development of the system itself. That is the question. Thank you. Who would like to start? <laughs> um, it's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Not an easy question. Um, 
Yes, um, I mean, we do recommend um, countries to upload in the public domain so that it is accessible and also um, for much broader audience, I mean, for the global access, for example. Um, but also, they're allowed to share all the sensitive epi data, for example, to the test scene, and only the sequencing data, for example, the raw reads can be, sequen can be shared in the public domain. So this is a one way of kind of maintaining the, um, the safety and security of the data. On the other hand, um, they could also um, submit some kind of epi data that they think according to the national legislations um, in the public domain as well. Um, um, <laughs> Still elaborating. <laughs> so regarding the controlled uh, data sharing, um, uh, from our side, um, yeah, there are definitely a lot of challenges. So definitely the first steps can be taken and then the discussions and then the, um, yeah. I mean, the WGS sequencing data we opened up in 2019 and also we have a huge pandemic to deal with and we have a lot of lessons that we learned from pandemic, from COVID, for example. So the importance of sharing the data is, is really, really evolving. And also a lot of legislations are changing over time in terms of the sharing. So the first steps of sh control sharing can be taken um, from the, uh, but in the near future. Hmm. Okay, so um, uh, my institutional answer will be, thanks for the suggestion, we will go back and we are just <laughs> analyzing that. Um, and that just implies that uh, I need to have a feedback from uh, my manager, of course, my legal department, the legal department of each member states. And just to let you the complexity to try to answer your question. Uh, in general, I would say that uh, um, we don't care if the data is public available or not. We just care that the data have a, a complete, nice, uh, a complete uh, trustable uh, chain of custody when we need to use the data in the moment we need to use it. For example, even the data is public available and we pull data from ANA, if we need to use that data in a risk assessment, the uncertainty is the use this data depend if our data provider make a validation of the specific data. So go to our system and practically append to our data, public available data, correct and validate the metadata. Otherwise, for example, this data will be not used fully in our assessment. This is just to give you, uh, for us, is the chain of custody and the, um, that is the most important information that we need to track. Giving access to our system to not uh, network maze, uh, of course, uh, is a community decision. Because as I said, our database is just designed for a specific scope uh, in a place where data which is, we don't own uh, arrive on specific uh, um, time and a specific uh, uh, objective. If, of course, the community of the people who actually feed our database want what you suggest, consider it valuable, I don't, I don't see why EFSA should not do that. But it's always, we, need, we are always deciding on the back of our community, which is the member states. I hope that second part is much better. It reflects the complexity of the thing. I, I think I can try and comment and from, from a national perspective, because of course, we are all interested in having the best data for research and for coming future on in, 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 in the further on in the future. And, and we have the same discussion in Denmark that we have shared these data for specific tasks, for sp under specific rules and with a specific agreement. And if we should go out of that specificity, specificity then, then we should make specific arrangements. But it is mentioned in all the agreement that if we want to continue with some more research in the area, then we have to take connection to the other stakeholders and to involve them in it. And maybe, for example, when it is research between SSI and, and DTU, it will be very much a discussion about research collaboration, whereas if it is using the data from, from um, the Veterinary Food Administration in, in, in another way, we have a, a specific form that we can apply them. Uh, to use it in another way. So, so we are aware of the need, we are aware of triggering, it's a tricky situation, but the basic is that we should trust these others that we have had this deal and we will fit with that. Thank you. So I would like to give uh, room to other questions posed from the remote audience. Yeah, there are yes, many questions. One is regarding how in ECDC you plan to replace bionumerics 
You know? But maybe I, I ask you other couple and then I stop. There is also another one. Is there any limitation for organizations at a lower level than the national level to be data provider to the EFSA database? Maybe I can ask this because it's quicker, I guess, from substituting binomerics. Uh, we don't have any limitation, so it's a decision at national level. We have an example of a member state where they centralize that interaction, so it's a, a single person, one single person for the entire country who actually submit data. Uh, other countries actually they have a more decentralized approach. They actually nominate a lot of persons for national authority, for local uh, authority to be directly interacting with us. So it's completely on, uh, on, a, on the perspective of the national uh, uh, dimension, so they might use whatever type is better fitting there. The legislative framework, the prioritization, uh, the ownership uh, protocol, or whatever it is for them. And then I'll leave you. A very difficult answer. Yeah, I will give a short answer for the bionumerics replacement. So currently we are developing the in-house cloud-based development uh, bioinformatic development tools, um, similar to um, the EFSA's bioinformatic pipeline, for example. So we have Azure and NextFlow pipeline that we are currently building on. And also, we will use bionumerics um, because the calculation engine will be replaced, but we will use the interface as such um, for some more time so to export the data and for enabling all the microbiologists and the epidemiologists to view the data. And also, um, ECDC formed the operational contact points for the bioinformatics um, so that this member states can be involved in the um, discussions with the cloud replacement solution so that they don't have to invent the wheel again. They can use the, um, um, the things. And we are also, we, we are intending to publish in the GitHub, like as I've said it, the open cloud-based platform so that it benefits all the member states. Okay. So I'm afraid there is time for one last question. Yes, Valentina, please. Uh, really the last, but it's interesting. Could the food industry submit their sequences directly to EFSA system? Would it be possible for any matches to be identified by only EFSA? Okay, second part of the question yeah, is very yeah, tricky. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really get it, but uh, maybe... So again, I go back to my answer before. It depends what the national, this national level decide how to interact with us. So our system is completely agnostic, meaning it is an ID with specific uh, capacity. If this ID is in the hand of uh, a food industry, it's fine. As soon as the national authority decide that. On the matching, yeah, well, uh, our user can perform match searching, uh, and this match searching can remain only visible to that specific user without being shared that information to the CDC, if that can be an answer to the question. Okay. Okay, so I'm afraid we are out of time for questions. So first of all, I would like to thank you very much to all the speakers uh, for this uh, interesting session and to all the audience here and remotely uh, that really participated actively in this, uh, in this question and answer session. Uh, so uh, it's time now to have some break and to have some real food after all this food for thought. <laughs> so um, I would just like to mention that uh, we will start again at four uh, with the next session that will be about uh, uh, the efforts on the interoperability and the development of new standards and this session will be chaired by Adrian Nassere uh, from the European I mean director of the European Union Reference Laboratory for Listeria Manusidogenes uh, and uh, which is uh, based at the French Agency for Food Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety at ANSES in France so uh, have some rest and uh, see you later on at four, please. Be on time. Oh, welcome back for this uh, second session of the uh, afternoon. So, my name is Adrien Serre. I'm the head of the European uh, Union Reference Laboratory for Listeria Monocytogenes. This EU URL is hosted in ANSES in France, and uh, I'm part of the work coordinated by, nicely coordinated by uh, Stefano Morabito and the EUR for E. coli. 
So this uh, afternoon session is uh, dedicated to interoperability and development of new standards. Uh, we will uh, get three presentations. The first uh, of uh, Angela van Hoek from RIVM uh, Netherlands. The second uh, uh, from uh, Emma Griffiths. She's coming from uh, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, uh, a presentation on the new international standard uh, for WGS data sharing. And last but not least, the third presentation uh, given by Eric Stevens uh, on genome tracker network experience. So as in the first session, um, the Q&A uh, session be at the end. So uh, please keep your question uh, for the, the end of the session. And uh, now maybe we can just uh, uh, welcome uh, Angela Van Hoek for this uh, talk on the inter-EURL uh, working group on WGS. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, re represent the inter eurl working group on NGS. Um, yes, uh, the, this working group has uh, started uh, collaborating uh, since uh, 2017 and we meet uh, twice a year. And the group consists of the ERLs working in the field of microbiolo microbiological uh, contamination of food and feed. So it uh, represents uh, five uh, ERLs working on bacteria. Uh, so Campylobacter, coagulase positive staphylococci, uh, E. coli, uh, which includes also the uh, stacks and uh, Listeria monocytogenes and uh, the ERL for Salmonella, uh, which I'm uh, part of. Uh, but it also includes the ERL for uh, AMR, uh, so antimicrobial resistance, uh, the one on uh, foodborne viruses and uh, parasites. And um, this um, Working group has uh, several aims. Uh, one of them is to promote the use of NGS and whole genome, C so WGS, uh, across the ne our network of NRLs and to build uh, the capacity for these techniques and uh, analysis within the EU, but also to ensure liaison with the work of, the, of our work uh, together with EFSA and ECDC. ECDC on uh, the uh, whole genome sequencing mandate that, we got, uh, that was sent out uh, by the Commission. And in order to uh, promote um, uh, the, the use of NGS, we had uh, some deliverables uh, that we uh, set ourselves uh, onto, and that was uh, drafting uh, yeah, some guidance documents on uh, nine topics to be uh, more specific, which are indicated here. And in the next few slides, I want to highlight some features of, uh, of these uh, documents. Um, first, uh, the, the first uh, one is dedicated to PTs. And uh, I don't know whether you can read it, but in the left upper corner, there's a link to each of the uh, documents uh, that were produced by us. The work was divided uh, for each ERL, uh, to a certain ERL, because it's impossible to do all the work uh, by one of the ERLs. And uh, this one on PTs was, is curated by the ERL on uh, AMR or AR antimicrobial resistance, and in the fall of uh, 2019, uh, we, we um, did a survey among our uh, ERLs uh, within the working group and to see how, uh, how many were already performing NGSPTs, and that was at the time uh, were five, and uh, that was included in the, in the document. Uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the future 
uh, PTs scheduled uh, for 2020 and 2022. And we also looked at uh, lessons learned from the way each ERL uh, performs uh, those PTs. And uh, the, currently this uh, guidance document is being uh, updated. And during our discussions and drafting of these documents, we also thought uh, that it would be good to uh, um, set up an online webinar, uh, which is scheduled uh, um, at the end of this month. Uh, and it's uh, on proficiency tests on an NGS approaches used by the ERLs. Uh, and it's predominantly for the benefit of the NRLs within our uh, um, uh, networks. The next one, which is uh, um, uh, on the reference, uh, we, we um, uh, build up a, a reference uh, collection, and it's uh, predominantly uh, built up from uh, NGS data that were, were obtained within the PTs performed. And PT, is, uh, for those of you that <laughs> maybe don't know, it's proficiency testing. Uh, 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 so. Uh, the sequencing files obtained within these PTs uh, um, yeah, were, were collected and, and put it together in this uh, uh, guidance document. And uh, it's predominantly for uh, the benefit of the NRLs, uh, who also have to uh, maybe perform PTs in their countries for the validation and benchmarking uh, for bioinformatic tools. And uh, it's some... It, this slide shows, sums up uh, what is in there in the, in the document. So there are uh, five, four, sorry, uh, four pathogen, bacterial pathogens uh, represented, uh, as you can read here. And uh, we also now have included uh, some uh, data on AMR uh, isolates. So looking for the resistance uh, genes. The third document uh, regards NGS laboratory procedures and this is curated by uh, the ERL uh, on parasites. Uh, we first identified whether uh, we already had some uh, standard operating uh, procedures and laboratory operat operational procedures available at the ERLs and uh, after uh, I did Identification of that, we uh, wrote this down uh, for bacteria, parasites, and viruses, but the document also includes uh, non-pathogenic specific, so more um, um, uh, specific matrices, uh, for instance, for uh, in the field of the food bomb viruses, so more met metagenome uh, uh, procedures. And um, so besides the DNA extraction, uh, these documents also focus on the library preparation, uh, so the wet lab part, and, and also potential workflows uh, once you uh, obtain the data. Um, and again, on the left upper part, you can see where you can find um, the, the, this document. And uh, maybe I should also say that each ERL dedicated on their own website uh, a, a, a certain page where you can find all the links uh, of these um, uh, documents that we drafted. Um, the, second, uh, the next one uh, uh, is, of course, you, uh, when you want to perform uh, whole genome sequencing or NGS, you want to have a high quality of uh, DNA. Uh, starting with it, uh, so this is more uh, can be viewed more like a supporting document, and uh, it um, highlights uh, yeah important topics that you have to take care of uh, one uh, in to ensure that your your you have high quality uh, DNA to start with or that it's pure enough. So focusing on the DNA extraction. Making, um, and making sure that uh, the stack you started with is still a stack, so it contains the STX uh, uh, genes or that an AMR plasmid is still there uh, and not just do something. And uh, so, yeah, be sure that you uh, start with uh, thorough material. After you get the DNA, check it, 
check the quality. It helps you further along in, in, the, in the workflow that you uh, have. And of course, also DNA concentration is important uh, uh, to, to, yeah, to look at. Um, and uh, another uh, guidance document that we drafted was on the bi available bioinformatic tools for basic uh, uh, analysis of the NGS data. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, we wanted to help N um, NRLs that were not uh, already uh, using NGS a lot, so that's why it's a basic, uh, yeah, fee is showing uh, basic uh, steps for analysis of the NGS data. So uh, looking at quality checks of the raw D uh, DNA uh, sequence data, trimming, what kind of assemblers can you use, uh, some uh, typing features, MLST, serotyping, uh, ser identification of the serotype, virulence uh, genes, uh, and the tools that are uh, described can either be open source, commercial software, of course the EFSA uh, One Health whole genome system, and its analytical pipelines and uh, several uh, features, uh, several <laughs> web servers uh, are uh, indicated in the document. Um, once you have your uh, data, you might want to look for clusters. Uh, do we see a cluster of human or uh, food-related uh, isolates? And uh, this document, uh, curated by the ERL Campylobacter, uh, looks at uh, several approaches, SNP analysis, gene-by-gene -gene analysis, KMIR analysis, also uh, mentioned, but it's um, yeah, it's a tinier part than the, the other two. And it looks at the pros and cons of uh, SNP-based and gene-by-gene -gene approaches. Uh, um, it uh, looks at the differences of the data, the resolution, comparability of the, of the results of both techniques. And uh, um, yeah, numerous tables, uh, Regarding uh, numer the document contains numerous tables uh, with uh, information on online uh, tools and, and software options. Uh, and uh, uh, you maybe saw in previous ones, uh, we have version control of the documents and this uh, in the second version, we also uh, added uh, some visualization uh, solution for cluster uh, data. So it's not, uh, so the, these documents should be viewed as li a live documents that uh, if something has to be added, it can be added. Uh, and uh, in the second version, I believe it's also interpretation of cluster data that has uh, been put in as well. Um, and then NGS uh, benchmarking, uh, curated by the URL of Listeria, uh, containing uh, information regarding wet uh, lab uh, 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 procedures as well as dry lab uh, procedures, quality of and quantity of input DNA, DNA library, and uh, regarding the dry uh, bench, uh, yeah, whether uh, the data that is produced is accurate or not. Uh, it's what you expect uh, uh, coming out of the data. And it also, the document also contains some uh, validations, uh, validation stages. Uh, it's important to know whether uh, you're able to reproduce the data uh, and repeat it in a similar way. It's enough sensitive, spe uh, specific, and also talking about validation of the whole uh, workflow. And um, we, an, another document that we drafted uh, concerned uh, inventory of training supports, uh, whether uh, we, we put in a summary of the training uh, programs that were already available by, by the various uh, uh, EURLs. And we added also suggestion of how to uh, pick up uh, such a training. Uh, yeah. Uh, not only uh, at uh, the dry lab level, but also at the wet lab level. level. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the 
uh, it summarizes what the URL uh, individual the individual URLs uh, are uh, giving uh, as training courses, but also the possibility uh, to uh, that that companies. Uh, um, give training uh, so on the dry lab and and uh, on the wet lab as well and uh, uh, so this is more focused on the e e the individual ERLs but uh, when we uh, gather each uh, year uh, twice uh, we also talk about uh, joint training and um, this uh, is what we did uh, three times now uh, at the moment uh, we started in uh, 2019 with three ERLs giving a, yeah, a sort of basic uh, training how to analyze the molecular uh, data that are obtained uh, by whole genome sequencing. Uh, we started with 12 participants uh, that year. Due to COVID, we had to skip uh, some years, but in 2022 uh, 20, and 23. Uh, we gave a, uh, a course called Introduction to Bioinformatics for Genomic uh, Data Mining. Uh, similar numbers of participants coming from uh, different NRLs and different uh, countries. And you see uh, so, uh, images of the meeting rooms that we uh, were in during those years. Um, and the last uh, guiding documents I want to tell you is the survey on the use of NGS across the uh, NRLs network. Uh, th this was actually the first action that we did, uh, uh, starting as the inter-ERL working group. In, in 2018, we uh, performed a survey uh, to ask what is the level of adoption of NGS at the EU, EU uh, level. And uh, the survey contained 20 questions regarding the topics I, I, I addressed in, in the previous uh, slides, so wet lab, dry lab, etc. 178 NRLs replied, and what was at 2018 uh, was that uh, yeah, nearly half of them said that they didn't have access uh, to or the, uh, that they didn't use uh, NGS technologies. And that's why we decided in 2019, we did a follow-up survey to uh, determine the cause of this uh, percentage. Um, and uh, regarding the first survey, uh, the answers to each question is uh, summarized. And you can find it uh, on each of our website, what the uh, document entails. Um, in order to get even more exposure of our work, we decided to uh, draft a position paper. Uh, so the work of the last five years uh, was written down in it and the topics already addressed. And we are very happy that we uh, got it published this year uh, in uh, micro by, uh, microbial genomics. Uh, so. Uh, Yay. Uh, um, and of course, uh, the reason why you're here uh, already mentioned uh, the, the brand, as I should say it now, the Science Meet Policy uh, Conferences, uh, our online version in uh, 2020. Uh, hosted in uh, or originating more or less uh, from Rome, uh, but it was online, but happy uh, and a lot of people attending. And I, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be able to join you here in the hybrid version of this conference. Uh, with, Sorry uh, to interrupt. Yeah. We... I'm wrapping up. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Yes, because. I'd like to mention uh, here course. in this, I, I won't do it uh, uh, naming everybody because of the time mm. then, uh, but uh, yeah, all the people are working at the URL and of, also uh, people from the commission and ECDC and EFSA. Yeah. Th thank you very much, uh, yeah. Angela. I, yeah. yeah, thank you very much for having, uh, summarizing all the activity of the inter EUL working group on NGS where you were part for the EOL Salmonella. Uh, yeah, it's a very nice uh, floor where we could uh, have a, a large um, exchanges and uh, we were able to produce uh, an amount of uh, document as you saw. So.
Thank you very much. Uh, so now, welcome to Emma Griffiths. So Emma Griffiths is from uh, the Simon Fraser uh, University. She works on the development of uh, data standards, and uh, uh, she works also on ontology. And uh, uh, her uh, fields are public health and food safety. Wonderful. So, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to come today to tell you a little bit about uh, data standards for something we haven't really talked about too much today. Uh, that is the uh, contextual data. Um, so in the next 20 minutes or so, I will uh, remind you of the challenges of integrating and harmonizing contextual data or metadata across labs and databases. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the interoperable contextual data standards uh, for private and public data that can provide us with solutions and benefits. I'll give you an example of implementation in the real world, and then I will wrap things up and provide you with a summary. All right, so when we're talking about genomics data, we are, of course, talking about the sequence data, but we're also talking about contextual data. And what we mean by contextual data is the sample metadata, the lab testing results, the clinical and epidemiological information, as well as the methods and provenance data that are absolutely critical for interpreting the trends that we see in the sequence data. And contextual data is really important stuff. Um, it can allow us to do many different important things like monitoring and quality control, uh, comparing re results between different laboratories, characterizing sequence types and clusters, generating hypotheses about sources of contamination, and also informing decision making um, and, uh, understand and, and allow us to monitor the effects of different interventions. So um, the way that we encode contextual data really impacts its utility and its usability. Uh, and in the absence of standardization approaches, our contextual data can suffer from things like errors, uh, the use of uh, field-specific jargon, the use of shorthand, um, something that we call sem semantic ambiguity, so the lack of clarity of meaning uh, of the information. So, and th this sometimes arises when the same words are, are used to describe different things or different words are used to describe the same things. Um, there's also issues that arise when there are different uh, data formats that are used, uh, which can confuse not just the people that are using the data, but also the computers that are used to, to process that information. And we also talk about information using different concepts, um, different fields and terms, uh, and at different levels of granularity. So, like I mentioned, data structure really impacts function. It can complicate the use and reuse of your own data across your organization because sometimes samples are collected by different people um, compared to those that are doing the sequencing, compared to those who are using the information to, uh, to, to perform interventions or make decisions. Um, it also can complicate the reuse of your own data across time, as Karen has already mentioned earlier today. If you've ever created a spreadsheet and gone back to it two years later, you know, you, uh, often you're like, what the heck was I thinking when I created this? Um, or if you have to share a spreadsheet with a colleague and they're taking over a program or, uh, or a project, often there's a lot of confusion um, there. Uh, and what we see is that the variability that is in private da databases often propagates out to public repositories. So this complicates all of the issues that we just discussed. And so contextual data or metadata standards are really important for improving data harmonization and integration. So uh, what are the benefits of, of data standards specifically? So similar to having a quality control framework for your sequence data, and we've talked about that earlier today, contextual data standards can provide quality frameworks uh, for your contextual data, uh, your contextual data, which helps to improve auditability. Um, it helps to capture provenance and acknowledgement, so establishing chains of custody in a standardized way, and also capturing uh, different roles and responsibilities, and who did what. So you can acknowledge them properly either in public repository submissions or in grants. Um, it also, data standards also help to streamline uh, the reuse of data and data sharing because you are improving the 
um, not just the quality, but also um, the way people can understand the information. Um, the data standards also help to reduce uncertainty, and that's because they create ex expectations for structure. So what are the fields and terms that we're going to use? Uh, what are the requirements? What fields and terms are optional versus which are required? And completeness. So what do you have to fill in, and how do you fill it in? Um, data standards can also uh, help to reuse uh, curation training skills, um, tools, and also agreements because you've, you've reduced that uncertainty, you've created that expectation. You're re when you're reusing data standards over and over again, you can reuse um, all of these resources. And data standards also help to future-proof your data. Okay, so what standards do we have on hand to help uh, standardize our contextual data? So the first one that I want to mention was created by the International Organization for Standards. Um, in case um, you're probably familiar with them already, but if you're not, this is an organization that creates standards based on uh, identified market needs. Uh, the way that it works is there are work groups of international experts that uh, consult uh, different stakeholders. They design the, the standards, which then go through multiple, multiple, multiple rounds of international review. Um, and so one of the um, uh, the, the, the impetus, um, one of the main values of ISO is uh, consensus. So what, whether uh, you're developing the standards or it's going through international review, consensus is key. Um, and uh, the, the goals of, of ISO standards are really to improve reproducibility, consistency, and quality. Okay, so now to get to ISO 23418 specifically. So this standard provides requirements and guidance for uh, the use of whole genome sequencing for typing and genomic characterization of food foodborne bacteria. These can be pathogens or non-pathogens. Uh, there are three parts to the standard. The scope of the standard is for uh, capturing and encoding information for um, uh, for uh, outbreak investigations, for source attribution, and generally just characterizing uh, bacteria. Um, as I said, there are three parts. There's a wet lab part that provides re requirements and guidance for uh, handling cultures, isolates, uh, library prep. There's a second part about bioinformatics, so processing raw data, QC, performing different kinds of analyses. I'm not going to talk about those today. Instead, I'm going to tell you about the third part, which focuses on metadata. So in the document, you have uh, tables of different standardized fields. Um, some I've given you a flavor for the kinds of fields uh, that are in the standard, um, but they're all about capturing information about the sample, the isolate, and the sequence. Um, in addition to the tables of standardized fields in the document, um, some of the data types require a little bit more elaboration, and so there are sets of annexes. Um, and in addition to the tables and the annexes, there's also something called an ISO SLIM. So this is a file, a specification that provides you with ontology-based uh, fields and terms that you can implement in any way that you like. You can put it in a spreadsheet, or if you have tech guys at your organization, they can create apps or build these uh, fields and terms into your information management system. So um, all, of to, all, uh, all of this to say that the goal of the metadata section in the ISO standard is to really improve data stewardship, establish best practices, improve reproducibility, and improve communication of, of contextual data. Um, okay, another standard that I wanted to mention was uh, a One Health AMR standard um, that, uh, that was built uh, based on the ISO framework, um, but the scope of this standard is a little bit wider. Um, it's built for using genomics and harmonized contextual data to understand foodborne AMR in food supplies in the environment. And so the scope, like I said, was a little bit broader in terms of the samples, um, that, uh, that, that are covered um, in the, the different fields and terms. Um, so it's meant for whole genome sequencing across different sectors, looking at samples, uh, covering different commodities, environments, and hosts. It was originally designed uh, by uh, different ca federal Canadian agencies, um, but they are now uh, moving towards uh, internationalizing the standard. 
So what's in it and how do you use it? Uh, the standard covers a lot of different kinds of information, like reconciling and tracking identifiers, uh, sample collection and uh, processing. Um, importantly, it tracks information about pre-sampling activities. So if there's something like a fertilizer application or vaccination of flocks or something that you want to keep track of because that may uh, affect your, your downstream data, you can, keep, you can uh, track that information. Also sampling and sequencing strategies. These are sources of bias and limitations, and so there are standardized ways of capturing that information. Uh, there's also fields and terms to talk about hosts, sequencing methods, bioinformatics and QC. Um, importantly, there, are, uh, there is a, a part of the standard to address um, capturing phenotypic testing information, risk assessment, and provenance and attribution. Now, we learned two important lessons from uh, developing the ISO standard when we went to create the, the AMR standard. Uh, the first is that uh, if you want there to be uptake of data standards, you really have to provide a clear way for people to implement them. Um, so you really need to develop tools that operationalize the data standards. And so we did that in two different ways. One, we created a spreadsheet with drop-down menus and the, some light validation. Uh, these are things that people are very used to using in um, lab settings. Uh, we also created an app called the Data Harmonizer. This has a few more bells and whistles than a standard spreadsheet, um, and it's really meant for curation validation and automating data transformations. The second lesson that we learned is that you have to make what fields are required very clear. And so we color coded the required fields. The, the standard itself is actually very big because our stakeholders communicate, communicated to us that there was lots of kinds of information that they wanted to track. Um, but what's required, is there's only about 15 to 20 fields. And so those are color coded in yellow. Okay, so uh, when it comes to public data sharing, um, there are a number of different, uh, let me back up a little bit. So uh, there are a number of different public repositories that you can submit to for sharing uh, foodborne uh, pathogen data. Um, some of the most used are the repositories of the INSDC, the International uh, Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. So this collaboration consists of three different uh, repositories, one in the US, one in the UK, and one in Japan. Um, so NCBI, uh, so, so these different repositories have a number of different attribute packages for standardizing the way contextual data is communicated in these public repositories. Uh, some are very generic, some are very uh, use case specific. Um, and so I've highlighted just the ones for you that are geared towards food. Um, so at NCBI, there are four uh, very important um, attribute packages for food, one that covers animal and animal feed, another that, that uh, characterizes um, samples from farm environments, another one for food, produ food production facility samples, and a fourth for, for human foods. Um, there are three different templates for each of these standards that uh, each one is geared towards viruses, bacteria, and eukaryotes. Um, there are also two slightly different scoped um, uh, path attribute packages. One is for general pathogens um, that are from environmental and food samples, and one is for One Health enterics. Now, over on the ENA side, I've highlighted uh, two different standards. Some of you in this room may have contributed to developing them um, or have used them before, um, but they are collaborative uh, jams by Compare, EC, ECDC, and EFSA. Uh, the first one is for samples that are associated with food, and the second is for samples associated with humans. So these standards, they are much smaller than the, uh, the, the two previous standards that I mentioned. Um, they really just concentrate on the really required information. Um, their contents overlap, but they are different. Okay, so another thing I wanted to mention is the use of ontologies. So um, ontologies are not data standards, but they are resources for, uh, for, for, you, for, for identifying standardized fields and terms that you can use to develop data standards. So um, essentially, ontologies are controlled or standardized vocabulary. They're organized into a hierarchy, something uh, similar to the beer ontology that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, importantly, 
importantly, ontologies are different than just regular food lists or, or vocabulary lists because all of the different terms in the ontology are linked using special logic. Um, the, uh, so for example, that is a relationship that you can see between a light beer and a beer. Um, these relationships can be very simple or they can be more complex. And these relationships can serve to link data in different ways. And also the hierarchy of ontologies help to enable classification for different types of analyses. Now, importantly, ontologies are meant to encapsulate vocabulary with universal meanings. So not just the vocabulary used at any one particular organization, um, and the meanings of terms are disambiguated using URIs. So these are sort of like universal identifiers. Um, but you can build organization-specific vocabulary into ontologies um, using different synonyms and labels. And that helps to enable interoperability between different dictionaries used by different organizations. Because you've identified the equivalents already and you've encoded them in the ontologies. Um, there's also communities of practice around building ontologies. Um, and so when you're using the same principles and practices to build different kinds of thematic ontologies, whether they're about food or um, anatomy or geography or disease, they are all interoperable. There's also different registries and port uh, portals to help make ontologies uh, more discoverable. There's also different languages and tools to help uh, implement them in regular practice. Three minutes, okay. Um, let me just scooch forward. So um, an important ontology that you might want to know about is called uh, Foodon or the Food Ontology. This has over 28,000 uh, uh, terms for different food products, feed sources, and different food processes. Um, it's, we, it, the one thing I wanted to mention is that we are currently building in, uh, we are currently mapping um, FoodX2 vocabulary into ontology, into Foodon to help um, promote interoperability. I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. And just to talk about um, where these things are being implemented. Um, so this uh, LexMapper here, this is an ontology-based tool that helps to curate data. It takes free text data. It converts it to standardized ontology terms. And optionally, um, it'll classify things according to third-party schemes. Um, and now, I, usually when I mention this, people say that's really great, but uh, where is this actually being implemented in the world? And what I wanted to highlight here was that um, ontologies and ontology-based tools are being implemented in Genome Tracker, which is a whole genome sequencing-based foodborne pathogen uh, network. Um, and this is part of its metadata curation system. Um, and they did a really nice study uh, looking at uh, or they wrote a really nice piece talking about the advantages of using ontologies and data standards um, in, in, their, in their network. Okay, sorry, I'm going to skip over things a little bit just to get, uh, just to um, describe to you how all of the different data standards that I've mentioned uh, fit together. Um, the, the, I guess the one take home message here is that there will never be one data standard to rule them all. Um, organizations will you know, always want to use their own systems and their own dictionaries, and that's totally fine. Um, I think the power of data standards comes in when you are sharing information between organizations. It could be uh, with trusted partners in a network, um, and that's when you might want to use something like the ISO standard. And in order to go from um, the, your, your organization-specific dictionaries to something like the ISO standard, you need, uh, you need interoperability, you need data management tools that can perform those transformations. Um, as well as if you were to go, to go from something like the ISO standard to the, the metadata packages that we were talking about uh, at the INSDC, again, it's all about interoperability and uh, data management tools. So what do we need to uh, implement data standards in the whole, gen whole genome sequen sequencing ecosystem? Uh, we need good data governance. We need to know what are the types of information that provide the most bang for the buck, um, what you're allowed to share, um, we need to know. We need to have consensus about what different harmonization approaches are the best, because then we can incorporate those into different tools and platforms and operationalize data standards. What's something that's really critical is community engagement. So we need people to use the standards, but we also need for them to input back into the system um, and tell us what works and what doesn't so that we can evolve the, stand, the, the data standards to meet needs. And to do all of this work, of course, you need money. So we need sustainable funding. 
Okay, so thanks. I know I'm over time. Uh, thank you very much to all of the data standard uh, developers and implementers, funders, and for you for listening, and happy to take any questions. Later. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, for your talk. Uh, now let's uh, let's welcome uh, Eric uh, Eric Stevens from the U.S. FDA. He's coming from uh, Maryland in the U.S. and is in charge of international policy making. No, that, no. <laughs> no. Let me cry. No. I'm, I'm helping out with it. No, not in charge. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yes. So thank you to the organizers. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, and thank you to the previous speakers. Um, you've made my job a whole lot easier in trying to explain some things. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the genome tracker experience and how FDA really transitioned to using whole genome sequencing and how um, we kind of see it going in the future. So to start kind of where we are now and where we want to go, it's always helpful to look back on what we started with. And so the big picture here, right, and I think that this has been reiterated in everybody's talks, is it doesn't happen overnight. You can't just switch a flip, oh, switch a flip. And, and let it go. So we've been working on this for more than 12 years at this point. We started with a pilot study just saying, hey, let's look at some re retrospective data. Let's see if it could maybe help, you know, tell a better picture than what PFGE did at the time. And we kind of immediately were like, oh my God, we're, you know, kind of thinking about going all in on this, you know, and then how do we do that? And at the same time, it's important to understand that FDA is just one of the U.S. federal agencies that are involved in um, food safety and public health. So we do a lot of the food environmental sampling. We work with CDC uh, that does a lot of the clinical sampling. And so transitioning from a system that um, kind of was housed in CDC and was utilizing kind of those PFGE clusters and detecting them to kind of, okay, we have this sequence data now. Um, the Human Genome Project had been completed. Um, well, actually, the Human Genome Project has just actually been completed. Um, but the draft sequences were released in uh, 2003, but they were being kind of hosted publicly, and we saw kind of some of the benefit for releasing the sequence data. And so then trying to think, how do we not only transition this whole system of all 50 U.S. states um, and housing the data, especially if we want to kind of maybe transition to go public with it, um, but uh, looking at kind of where to begin and then training the people. So, you know, slowly over time, we, 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 we checked a few more ticks off of our, our boxes. We started small pilot studies. Um, we, you know, then have to also think about regulatory or legal concerns. So in the U.S., we have a kind of a whole system of what can be used for evidence in a court. FDA is a regulatory agency, and occasionally we, we do have to go to court um, for some of our findings to support them. So how do we get whole genome sequencing data to be kind of admitted into that? Um, and so slowly over the years, you know, we started sequencing more, adding more to the database. Um, it took uh, probably at least six years before we seriously started um, this to really transition the entire U.S., um, including CDC, to using whole genome sequencing, so training all of the uh, state public health labs, which was a big undertaking by CDC to get to use this technology. And I always think it's cool to um, put two things in perspective when we're talking about sequencing. Um, one is at the end of 2021, we had over 600,000 uh, genomes that were available in the public database. Today, it's well over a million. And I think that's terrific when 26 years ago, we first sequenced the E. coli genome at several million dollars. It, it cost us in a kind of a worldwide collaboration effort. And now we can do it at cost, not talking about labor, um, for about $20 a sample, which really starts to get into play then for how we can utilize this for really public health. So that big thing for us for transitioning when, when we think thought about this, and uh, Dr. Steve Musser is in the room who was intimately involved with, with some of these decisions, was how are we going to store this data? Are we going to do it ourselves? Are we going to spend the money, the time, the infrastructure on housing this data? Or are we going to look elsewhere, something that maybe you know has already had experience with us? 
So for us, uh, we went to the National Center for Biotechnology. They housed human genome sequence data because in the US, anybody that receives federal funding dollars has to make their data published. Uh, it was really cool about the human genome sequencing project. Um, and if I'm talking about human genome sequencing too much, it's because my background is in human genetics and I transitioned over to food microbiology. Um, it's really because that data was made public all along the way. So right when it began in kind of 1990, all of those little pieces from all the different chromosomes were made available to the community, to the world, so that they could be used in real time to help develop the kind of the next generation. I guarantee you we would not be here today um, if that didn't happen because we transitioned to the next generation of sequencing technologies because of the Human Genome Sequencing Project. Um, so we're able now to sequence uh, at a cost far kind of below where we started um, to making that data available. So we used um, NCBI because it had the capability to store human genome data, which, you know, if anybody wants to know, it's three billion base pairs. So when you're talking about three to five million for a bacterial sequence, it's a lot easier to house. And we could spend what kind of initial startup costs that we had on actually sequencing as opposed to maintaining a database, building it, um, and then and then carrying it on. So we made some of the big decisions up front, which really, I think, enabled um, better improvement and how we could traffic data in and out of labs, where to focus, um, how to, to have our data be analyzed and compared to others. And I think, you know, one thing is pretty clear after, you know, you know, more than a decade of experience. It's not the sequencing that is a challenge um, when utilizing or transitioning to this data. It is how you're going to analyze it, how you're going to train staff, how you're going to gain those skills, um, and how you're going to enable the entire system to utilize this effectively. So talks a little bit now about where we've come from to today. Um, and so I'm not going to spend too much time um, talking about kind of how data flows in and out or, you know, what data is associated with the sequence data that we upload. Thank you, Emma. That was a fantastic presentation on contextual data. And really, when you're talking about sequence data, that contextual data puts it... Um, it gives that data life. It tells you where those bacteria came from, how they were living, and when we're starting to think about the interventions we can make, we need that information to really uh, understand the complete picture. So as of today, um, anybody can upload to NCBI, and it's linked uh, to those other databases across the world. And so anybody can participate, they can upload, and those with kind of limited um, data analysis uh, expertise can start utilizing some of that data. Uh, uh, phylogenetic trees are released daily, and we're working on some, some great kind of dashboard visuals on really how to make um, the data as can tell as best a story as possible um, in a variety of different settings, because if I'm using this data and looking at it, I'm going to be looking at it for, for my needs and my purposes. I you know, would expect that anybody in the audience, as an example, would be using it kind of for their own purposes. So how can we kind of as a global community, as, as data users, try to make the best um, use of the data we have. And what's always surprising is sometimes the best insights for maybe how we could change things come from those with a fresh perspective that are kind of outside. Um, and so I'll get into kind of some of the, 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 the different graphs that I have in later talks and talk about them a little bit more. So uh, we've spent a lot of time, again, as, as previous talkers have, have gone into detail on, on how we can um, best make use of this data. And for us, that really is making it kind of independent, um, open data, making it available to anybody at any time. Again, because if we're talking about specific needs, somebody may be very interested in salmonella, somebody may be very interested in E. coli, sometimes they overlap with some of the interventions you can make to for preventive controls and reducing or preventing contamination, um, you're going to want to somehow link them. So we've tried to make these um, as public friendly as possible and try to have as open transparency as possible. Again, we are a regulatory agency, so we really try to think about that every step of the way. So we tried to document um, kind of our analysis pipeline and make that public and kind of our thought process so that if somebody else, let's say a company, wanted to re reproduce the analysis that we did, they can follow a step-by-step -step, um, procedure and hopefully do that. 
And I'm not gonna spend any time on some of the, the importance of, of metadata because I think Emma did a really brilliant job with this. And again, it's because that metadata helps to tell a complete picture. Without that metadata, you have a DNA sequence. And a DNA sequence can tell you some stuff, but it's not going to be as useful and tell you a complete picture if you don't have everything. And again, at the same time, we really worked on trying to make data analysis as open to as many people as possible because we have that knowledge where it's really hard to teach somebody command line. And if you don't have that experience, we're not talking about a few weeks to learn and adapt. We're talking about months, if not years. So how can we make something that, again, doesn't have to maybe go through a private company, you don't have to buy the software package, um, and you don't have to worry about all the issues that go along with that, but how can we kind of make as user-friendly a thing as possible? And what I really love about the bioinformatics community, and what I've loved since ever since you know I was doing my PhD and postdoc was you know, they made their documentation and their programs kind of freely available to the community at large and improvements were made um, to them based on, you know, how the feedback that they got were. So every generation was better um, when we're talking about what more can we do? Have we done things right? You know, what could we do better? And so I really like that, you know, we're enabling as many users as possible to utilize this information. I think that is really key, especially when we go into One Health. And when we start thinking about how this data can be used, not just by a specific sector, as you know, the speakers outlined you know, in, in the first session earlier this afternoon, you know, we're talking about how it can be utilized across the One Health spectrum. And in my opinion, and I'll go into this a little bit later, is that you know, foodborne diseases is really one of the best examples of um, kind of a One Health surveillance today. So when we talk, as Emma did, about you know, how we can make the data as useful as possible, it's all about getting that, that accuracy on telling the metadata to make that story as complete as possible. So you know, we've worked, um, not just us, this is a collaboration with others as well, to really help um, do some of those packages and, and make them available so people could start putting in better um, information. And so it's just an example on where you can find a host of these that were talked about earlier um, on NCBI, um, and they can walk, walk you through them. Um, for you know, One Health, I think that uh, really whole genome sequencing and the metadata associated, associated with it really helps us to tell a complete picture of how a foodborne pathogen that ultimately makes somebody ill and which we're trying to prevent um, is to understand how those contamination events happen, maybe how they survive in facilities or on the farm, how they get into the water, and, and ways that um, we can start, you know, not only thinking about human health, but really tackling that one health spectrum of environmental and animal health as well. Um, and, you know, we, we saw examples for AMR as well on how, you know, that naturally um, can be gleaned from the information that's in whole genome sequencing. Um, again, if one person is sequencing just foodborne pathogens or uploading it, somebody else who maybe has an interest in AMR, they're going to be able to utilize that data because it's been made public. And they're going to be able to utilize it hopefully well because there's that contextual data that goes along with it. Um, and, you know, over time, this is just to emphasize that, you know, we're really happy to be part of a genome tracker network and, you know, some of the work that we started um, you know, really way back in 2012 when we, you know, this was just a pilot exercise, this was just kind of a, a pipe dream on, you know, this is where we want to go. Think about over the years, you know, the first two years, you know, you're, you're starting slow, sequencing a few thousand samples, uploading them, and then really kind of finding your groove, finding partners, finding others who also want to upload that data uh, into that collective whole. And that's how you end up with over a, a million sequences um, in the database. And once you have those uh, data in the database, you can start looking at some really cool things that may not have gone into your mind um, when, when you first started this. So you can look at the percentage of environmental samples versus the clinical illnesses. And you can do that by region of the world and where they upload. And so when you start thinking about, you know, we have a global food supply, global food chain, everybody eats three meals a day, 
Um, you can start thinking, well, where do we maybe need more data from based on where we get food? And you can start doing some of those projects to tackle those problems to better understand how the food becomes contaminated in the first place. And you wouldn't know any of this unless you had this data that can help point the way. Eric? Four minutes, yes. <laughs> Um, and so it's really essential to be able to link those clinical to food and environmental so we can get a better sense of where can we uh, direct pilot studies, future research, where that is needed to understand maybe how, you know, contamination um, occurs on a farm. And so, you know, then going and undertaking studies where we can maybe, you know, get to a point where we could say, you know, you want to use this water source, not that water source, and maybe even future, maybe it's by time of year. So you can say this water source from point A to point B, and then that water source from point C to point D. And so Genome Tracker, um, I'm really proud of this, um, is personally responsible um, for almost 100,000 food and environmental isolates to really help um, tell a more complete picture of you know, linking clinical isolates um, back to their sources. So we can really kind of not only respond to foodborne outbreaks, but then try and prevent them. And so... Um, something that I'm really happy Emma talked about is about the, you know, better describing them. So when you start looking at, you know, where your sources of um, food or environmental isolates that have been linked to uh, human illnesses, where have they come from, right? So we can start doing source attribution. We can start doing more preventive targeting um, for them. Um, you know, we, we can start making the slide better and better and more specific, not only helpful um, kind of on human side and, and um, responding to outbreaks, but on the prevention side and where we need to focus more. Uh, we have a case study here, which I'm going to skip um, just in, in due to time. It was about um, uh, anoki mushrooms and listeria, and essentially the take-home message is, you know, if we can really be, get to a point where we can upload data in real time, um, we can really start to make those connections as early as possible um, to, you know, really start to get a contaminated product out of the market. So um, we have also talked about, you know, whole genome sequencing as one part of the story. There's other things as well. But I want to spend, you know, the few minutes I have left really talking about, you know, where we can go from here and what we can do. Um, and so when we start thinking about not only responding to, you know, foodborne outbreaks and diseases and start transitioning to how can we prevent the contamination from occurring in the first place. Let's talk about a facility, for example. You know, you're not going to do whole genome sequencing to ID a pathogen. You know, you can do a quick culture method to see a presence or absence. But if you have a facility that's really concerned about whether they have a resident pathogen in that facility, you 100% would like this information from whole genome sequencing. And when you can expand that further to farms and talking about maybe potential water sources, um, you, you can really start to prevent these contaminations and hopefully prevent the illnesses from, from ever occurring. Uh, and that's one of the big projects that we have right now is really just kind of looking at water. Um, really, especially when you're getting into data sharing issues, just sampling public water, we're really trying to do outreach on this. And so we're hoping to have a meeting kind of next year with the Food and Agriculture Organization on the importance of kind of water sampling and, and how we can link that to human disease. And what's interesting about all of this, and this is kind of the last point that, that, that I will make, is when you start doing projects in different parts of the world, World, you start understanding that everybody has issues that maybe aren't issues for you. For example, we've done a lot of work in Latin America, and the big problem with getting started in sequencing is availability of reagents. And so when we think about what it costs in the United States, and then really starting working with partners, and hearing that it costs five to seven times more for reagents that we pay, that becomes an issue. And so that's where we have to start in that region. And so when we're talking about this being utilized by the world, um, we really have to start focusing on those issues where they're going to make the most impact. And with that, I will stop and leave it on a slide of um, economics. Well, that's important too. I'm happy to ask question, answer questions about that. But I'll leave it with kind of metagenomics as well, because now we're talking about what are we going to do with a collection of microbes in a sample and that collection of metadata? And how are we going to move forward with that? Um, and so I'll end there. I don't want to no make problem. you any more nervous, but I'll end there. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. Um, so I may uh, invite uh, again uh, on stage uh, Angela, please, Angela Van Hoek.
and Emma Griffiths again to start the question and answer qu uh, session. So the, the Slido link is uh, displayed for remote participants. If you want to interact with our speakers. Okay, so uh, I invite you to start uh, raising your hand or there is a question over here, so please. Hi, uh, Andrew Page from Tijin Genomics. I'm just wondering about uh, the move from culturing over to uh, PCR-based methods for because it's cheaper, and uh, what impact will that have on surveillance? Who's willing to? Can I phone a friend? Um, <laughs> we actually have somebody here from, from CDC um, from the US who I think maybe would be better uh, positioned to handle that, but because that is an issue when you start losing access to physical kind of samples for that. I don't think from a kind of food regulatory side that is necessarily an issue. When we go into facility, we, we swab, we, we keep everything um, because we need that, you know, in the eventuality we might need, you know, support to go to court. So it's not something in this, an area that we worry about, but on the public health side for clinical illnesses, I think that would of course be something that we're concerned about and trying to, to find ways around. And if Laura wants to correct me on anything or, or add two things to that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to phone a friend. <laughs> um, do, do you guys have any to? So the phone is ringing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must not have screwed up too badly with that. Okay. I guess I will add something. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eric, you did a, a fabulous job. Um, from the CDC perspective, um, Culture independent diagnostic testing is something that our lab does uh, worry about as it seems to be increasing um, from a clinical standpoint. Um, but some labs are doing some of the ref ref um, reflex um, sampling and are able to get cultures uh, that way. But um, it hasn't really affected um, CDC's um, uh, way to identify outbreaks as far as we know. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any question? Yeah. yeah, Stefano, please. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, uh, my question uh, is mainly addressed to Emma. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, it seems that ontology is the key to success. I mean, uh, of course, it's a way to decode or re-encode the data, uh, the contextual data, uh, in order to make different system interoperable, but also to make a sense of the data themselves. Um, at the same time, it seems to me that the general community is, is a bit reluctant to, you know, uh, think about uh, the possibility of using one ontology system with respect to the others. Uh, I would like to ask you all, of course, to elaborate on that. I mean, how can we uh, facilitate the uh, adoption of shared ontologies by the communities? Because we are talking about different communities dealing with NGS. So what's your opinion on that? Could you elaborate on that, please? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Fabulous. Um, so you're absolutely right. There really, there really is a, a, a great reluctancy to adopt uh, universal ontologies. Um, and that's largely because I think organizations, they, they know their needs. They know the, the types of vocabulary that their stakeholders and their data providers are used to using. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're reluctant to, to re-engineer their systems 
uh, for the, the use of, uh, for implementing ontologies where the benefits are not really clear at this point. And I think I've been having conversations with different folks the last couple of days exactly about this. And it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation where you need people to adopt ontologies so that you have good examples of how they add value. Um, but in order to get you know, in order to get those examples, you have you, you need people to to start to implement them. People won't implement them until they they see the examples. So, um, you know, I, I think right now it it's about coming up with those really good examples of how ontologies add value. So, one of the slides that I had to skip over is 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 basically describing how using ontologies. One helps to standardize. I think that's the the, the way that uh, that's something that, that people can understand. But I think it also prepares your data to do more kinds of complex analyses. So doing inferencing, um, uh, doing um, you know preparing your data for different like AI machine. Uh, learning, all of these kinds of things. Infer I said inferencing already. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so if we can get good examples of, of the, the complex queries and things that you can do that you, you can't get with just using vocabulary lists, that you can only do by using ontologies, um, that will encourage people to buy into the system more. And I also think we need more tools that will implement ontologies in an invisible way you know, like a good ontology, honestly, is an invisible ontology. And it's really the tool that's doing the work that people need to interact with. Um, so I, we need good examples of how ontologies are adding value. And we are working on that. Um, but uh, it, it's a little difficult right now to, to, to point to, you know, um, that added value in, in outside of the standardization. And we also need the tools. There are a, a growing array of ontology-based tools that help to deal with data in different ways. Again, I had to skip over those. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, so we need more tools and we need better examples of, of added value. And I think those things will help to, to um, bring people over to the, to the dark side of ontologies. <laughs> the bright side, the bright side. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this answer. Maybe uh, it's uh, the turn of the yeah. remote participant question, Mirko. Yeah, um, we have a question from um, ontology that I just now share, but you can lead and think um, from Andrew that is sitting there, but it's very nice. <laughs> Will ChatGPT make ontologies obsolete? But don't, don't, don't answer this now. It's not uh, very... <laughs> so let's go a little bit something. Uh, uh, we are a question from uh, Alberto from Andalusia that is very relevant. Uh, um, in the U AU, for those laboratories that are working in the WGS, but they are not NRL, uh, is there any option to participate in uh, intercomparative tests? I guess this is Angela for... Uh, maybe I can rephrase the question. So for laboratories and you that are not national reference laboratory, how can we be, be involved in, in your, I guess, proficiency test or testing? I think, but uh, uh, if, you, if you pay, then maybe you can participate. But I'm not sure whether that's actually the case for each URL. Maybe but. something that you can discuss, I don't know. Um, but um, maybe we can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe Stefano, Stefano can uh, address this. Uh, <laughs> I'm not head of the ERL, yeah, so yeah. I'm. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we have a few head of ERL. Yeah, 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 we can answer. Also. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, sticking on the mandate of an ERL does not the possibility for laboratories which are not NRL to participate in the, in, in the uh, you know, in the proficiency test organized in the framework of the work program. Because those uh, proficiency tests are actually paid by the commission and the amount that is really specific for NRLs. But uh, the idea of the NRLs is to establish a kind of a cascade with respect to the NRLs, which in turn might be able to deliver within the member states, the, the same proficiency testing scheme to laboratories which are not NRLs. That means official labs as well as private labs. So this is the idea behind the general organization in Europe. 
Okay, thank you. I can confirm. And I, and I can, I mean, add to that, and I also will say this huge caveat in the beginning is I don't actually know the comparisons between what goes on in a proficiency test for, for the EU versus one for Genome Tracker, but we do also engage with proficiency tests. We're more than happy to work with anybody um, to, to, to kind of go through the Genome Tracker proficiency step process, which might, you know, just be of relevance to see if you have the basics down and if you, you know, are beginning, that's a great w way to start. Okay, thanks. Um, just an housekeeping uh, uh, information for Sean and Neil. Uh, yes, we are going to present, uh, uh, to share the presentation slides afterwards. So uh, you're going to, sign, to find that. And uh, also our uh, video will be published on our website. Okay, after this, we have a, a very nice question from Nico Van Belsen. Um, maybe a difficult question, but I guess it's may trick some discussion. Are there fundamental differences between the food-related WGS approaches in the US, Canada, and Europe? US, Canada, and Europe, we are here. So are there fundamental differences between the food-related WGS approaches? I'll begin. Oh. <laughs> I volunteer as tribute. Um, Thank you. You know, I, I, I think it really goes to that public-private, I think. I'm going to come right out and say that as kind of the main difference. Um, accessible to data, I, you know, they each have, you know, you can come up with pros and cons for each. Um, but, you know, I really think it's, at the end of the day, it's, do you want a system that, you know, you can centralize and kind of restrict access to um, and, you know, have more control over versus one where maybe more open, you don't obviously have as much power to, but anybody can kind of participate and anybody can, can kind of gain information back from them. I, you know, I think that's going to be, the, that's the difference. So I would say in terms of, uh, the way Canadians deal with, uh, or implement whole genome sequencing for, for understanding foodborne pathogens and tracking foodborne pathogens, I would say we go a little bit more on the private approach. Um, so we use platforms like Arita that got mentioned earlier, uh, today to, uh, to, to share data in a much more controlled way rather than sharing it very publicly. I would say that we, 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 we maybe not have the best reputation when it comes to data sharing sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, but we are, we, we are trying, uh, to do better. Um, and so... Uh, so I would say that's, I mean, we're definitely embracing whole genome sequencing. A lot of, the, of, of samples get sequenced, but it's come, it's the data sharing part that's different. So unlike the U.S. that is, you know, somehow able to share so much data, um, uh, we, we do uh, deal with it in, in more controlled private ways. So, so you mean that on the pipelines it may be equal, but on the data sharing it is the main differences? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but that is also like, we don't share everything, right? We go out to facilities and we do inspections. We don't, you know, share the names of the firms or other things that are, you know, private information like that, but we share the basics. We do have mini metadata that we do share. So I will say, even though we're saying, you know, open data, it's, you know, data that makes it useful while withholding that information that's obviously sensitive in nature. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah maybe. I, I don't know whether I can add uh, anything, but of course, within the EU, we have all those countries, like you have Canada and the US, that's only in one con country. Of, of course, you uh, have uh, certain states and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, uh, it's difficult, I think, for, uh, for the EU to uh, have everything uh, the same way in all those countries. We have other questions anyway, so if, if you yeah. are not having questions in the audience, I will proceed. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Mirko. Well, a very quick question from, uh, for Angela. Uh, could other URL access to the draft document that prepares the inter-URL working group? So, yeah, yes. Sorry? The, the could guidance. Could other URL access to the draft documents and which is really yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. The, all the, all the, uh, each EURL has a link to all the documents in their own website. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe it was just... Maybe not that's what w was not clear yeah, from my yeah. uh, uh, talk. Sorry. No worry. And um, 
This is a, another question on uh, uh, AI and ontology that again puts you for you to talk, but maybe we move to another uh, question that is uh, um, to um, uh, you say nothing mentioned on Nanopore and, or PacBio. Are bioinformatician pipeline validated for analysis? Uh, which one? That may be for... Yeah, yeah, they're, they're validated for, for, for both of them. At, okay. at, it, at the EU, we're not there yet, I think. We're mainly focusing on the short read uh, sequencing at the moment. But maybe in future, we'll adapt uh, the documents that we generated and also impl implement more the long read sequencing uh, protocols and features of those. Because, as I said, uh, documents are live documents that um, some of them might uh, need uh, regular or regular, at least some updating. And I mean, to, to add to that, I mean, we are talking about, you know, data analysis and, you know, I would say we're always learning and we're always improving and making, you know, how we do things better, which is great. Um, and you know, the great thing about sequence data too, this, you know, also goes to, you need that experience on the data analysis side, um, to be able to, to take that, you know, fast Q data. Um, and you know, if you give it to me, you know, even if it's a terrible run, I'm going to see that, um, you know, you can do your own quality control kind of independent of some standardized processes for how to sequence or how to analyze. Um, which is great. You want that, that adaptability and flexibility um, to be able to do things specific to your project. Um, so standardization of certain things are important when you're doing them for specific purposes. Um, but for the general kind of question on kind of where can we go and make these, you know, better, um, there, there's some wiggle room, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is there anyone in the in the room that has a, a question? Can I ask the audience a question? <laughs> so I mean just to be very interesting, right? We're talking, you know, here about, you know, utilizing these technologies. I mean, where do you if, you know, if we had the first one in 2020, you know, the next one, let's say 2026, you know, let's say, you know, let's skip over one. Let's say, you know, 2033, we meet here again in 10 years. Um, what are we talking about? Where do we think this is going and, and what the issues will be kind of in the future? Haha, -ha, I did the I'm Uno reverse card. The I'm not sitting in the stage. So. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's that's helpful, right? When we want to think about how to use utilize this, you know, we have to think about where we are heading. Because if we don't try and solve some of those immediately obvious problems that come out, we're just gonna run face first into that wall. Oh, thank you, Bur. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> If we would reach the stage as genome tracker is now, that would be really a success in, German, in Europe. <laughs> Sorry to say this for Europe. So I think uh, in the US you are quite forward with the technologies and, and the thinking and so on. And I mean, this has all reasons because uh, Europe has, are much more diverse and so on. But um, I would wish for this uh, for the future that um, we come a little bit more in move to sample data just to do it, not so much to discuss just to do it, as I have realized more or less as you did uh, with genome tracker at the beginning. Uh, that's that's one point, of course, and in terms of technologies, of course, um, technologies becomes more and more accurate, more and more faster, more and more um, efficient. And um, yeah, for example, for the Oxford Nanopore technology, because it was a question, we did some, let's say, proficiency tests or ring trials with some laboratories and tested them for outbreak investigations. Uh, Oxford Nanopore technology, but it was with the older version of uh, of the of the flow cell um, 9.4 and the data were not well 
for doing that. But uh, with the new flow cell, it becomes better. But even then, um, the data are not so accurate at the moment with the Illumina technology. But of course, there comes up more and more uh, or better technologies, for example, with the PEC bio system and so on. They are even more accurate, they promise. So um, I think it becomes more and more easier to apply it at, at the end in, in five to 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, that's my opinion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Maybe a, a comment on uh, the, uh, the EU approach. Um, as an EUL, I don't know my colleagues at uh, other EUL, um, there is uh, something that comes back that uh, at EU level it's more complex and it's difficult to work. I'm not sure of that. We work together into the EU areas and uh, when we have our workshop or working group uh, with our NRL network on our uh, topics, it works well. Uh, we could have uh, uh, produced the guidance, the infrastructure is now on. So I think maybe the, 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 the thing to tackle is uh, at the management system because uh, the confidentiality and at member state level they don't want to to maybe have less control on that but uh, on the technology uh, we have a, a nice, nice uh, example of success so um, I'm sure we will uh, go on and uh, try to diffuse the, 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 the good way but it's sure it is sure we need the policy makers to, to help us and uh, to make it uh, uh, very efficient uh, as you show your example, I think. Maybe. Uh, thank you. If I, if I may add to the wish list, I would like to see uh, yeah, a bit more of building trust in the system. Mm. I mean, focus on the technologies is a thing. Um, you know, focusing on the gaps, it is something that actually is much needed uh, in order to bridge possible, uh, you know, uh, lack of whatever is needed for the system to work. But we are, my impression that is that we are still uh, forgetting to involve the wall system in the in the story you know building trust is part of the story because uh, if we want to bring the industry in we need to convince them that we are not working against them but rather for sure to protect public health but also to protect the name of the industry themselves and also uh, another point would be to uh, enlarge the inclusion of the environmental sector within the real One Health circle. I mean, I'm not just talking about, you know, that uh, the environment of the primary production or whatever, but I'm thinking about, you know, more modern ways to look at things such as the wastewater-based epidemiology, for instance. So the road is not there. I mean, it's still long and we still need to build a lot of trust for the system to work. That's my point. And that, that is what I would like to see uh, and I would like to be in the wish list for the next three years. I 100% agree with that and I have two kind of specific comments. The first will be, we spent an awfully long time with outreach to industry and on how we were going to use whole genome sequencing and what it meant. We had conversations over years, sometimes the same exact conversation over years on building that trust, getting them to understand, you know, what the technology is, getting them to understand how we were going to use it, but also getting them to understand how they could use it for themselves. And we know that industry, you know, they're not uploading to the database. A, a, a few are maybe anonymously, um, but from our point of view, we're still incredibly happy that they're using the data that's there and are employing this for specific problems like a transient or resident strain, we know that they're using that information. Um, and so that was an ongoing conversation that we've had for, for many years and it, it has gotten a lot better to that where now you see industry regularly doing presentations at conferences on how they've been using it. And the second thing is building that trust and expanding that network to include more partners, um, you know, that, that data sharing, it, 
problem is very real. And so when we start, you know, pilot projects with partners and trying to build Genome Tracker, it's what are the least risky samples? What are you comfortable with, you know, getting your feet wet with? So, you know, in some instances, we start with water, public streams, public ponds, let's start there. Um, and, and, you know, let's not start about, you know, not, not produce, maybe not on melons, not on something like that, but let's start small and build our way up. And over time, that is an approach that we've taken along it, as well as um, making sure that industry is also there. So if we're working in different countries, we're building up um, those partnerships within those countries so they don't feel like it's just the U.S. coming in, but it's actually building capacity kind of where it's needed. And we found some of those approaches to be very good. Um, the other one I will say, and then I will let my colleagues kind of jump in here, um, is, you know, looking at kind of pilot studies on import sampling, right? So, you know, if you're comfortable doing that, you know, we, we, we've done some small scale things and just, you know, talking about who owns the data, if it comes into your country, I, I think you, you can make the argument that it is your data at that point. So sharing it, you know, you, you maybe let's start there. And so we're, we're open to kind of any of these situations to try and get up to that place where, you know, we build that trust because we've spent time building those relationships. There is a question on, yeah. I don't know if the microphone is on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, um, one consideration from my Sorry. point of view, I, I am a public officer I work in, in Italy at regional level and I'm responsible for our regional genomic surveillance. It's a one health surveillance, so we, we test uh, isolates from humans and from environment, food, etc. And our experience is that there is a need, uh, especially in our reality, uh, to close the gap between uh, the world of generating the data, the sequencing itself, so the laboratory and the analysis what we are talking about today, and the culture of those that are the competent authorities that should use this type of information on the field. Because as you said, the context data are essential, and so those are the guys that know those data, and they have to, to make the bridge between the data and the hypothesis that you generate, identifying clusters, etc., and implementing this at field level in the, on the territory, etc. This is very important. And what I, I was noticing here today, for example, we are in Europe, we talk a lot about uh, European reference laboratories, national reference laboratories, but then we have to bring everything to, to the, the ground level, okay? That's what I think is important. It, this is cultural and also organizational, of course. It's, it's both. I think this is very, very important. So we have to bring everything. And then, of course, yes, it has already been said, in Europe, probably we have a limitation in the openness of the data. And this is a problem that we have because we have these national levels that is creating a problem. But closing the data is a strong limitation to access inevitably. So that's what I feel is very, very important. Maybe a suggestion, maybe or might be try to start opening the data on the human side, which is less sensitive in an anonymous way, of course, because food industry information and data are more sensitive, of course, but the human data could be opened. That's a suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. Someone wants to compliment or? We have other question if you. Uh, yes, it's welcome. Thank so you. We have a, a multiple question about uh, how we can involve industry, food industry um, how the uh, how we can like involve in uh, to get the food industry data without breaking the trust of the industry? How can that can go together within uh, um, future regulation framework? Uh, if we think about 2032, uh, how that framework can regulate the, the use of WGS in uh, in a larger sense? So. I mean, I'm just trying to summarize the three or four questions in one. So uh, the general topic here, how can we involve the industry now in the discussion? How can we get the data without breaking the trust and how we can future 2020, 2032 regulation framework can be, um, yeah, allow the use of WGS in that concern? If you have something common. Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> I think you just asked a series of million dollar questions um, that I don't know that we have the answers to today. But I think that, um, you know, the ways that 
that contextual data standards can contribute to this is um, building trusted systems where you can control what types of data are shared um, kind of on demand. Right, so if you're in a situation where you can, where, where it's not across the board, we're only sharing these four pieces of metadata, right? It, so they, if you're in a trusted network or something, you can say you can use access controls and be able to share a little bit more information. I think once you start to build up this uh, series of examples of how, when you've shared, um, the 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 sky hasn't fallen, um, people will start to trust more. Um, but it's really context dependent, it's really situation specific. So I think uh, giving people that control in different situations, what they can share um, will, will, will help to, to, to increase trust. Um, yeah. it, it's about having conversations um, and, you know, I don't really want to speak on kind of the conversations we have on a compliance side. I'm, I'm not personally involved with them. I just know it goes something like, you know, if going out to a facility, you know, having a positive result, you know, walking the industry through what those results mean as, as one place to start, you know, um, and having conversations dependent on, well, have you been doing this? Have you been doing that? Um, and then, you know, we've had dedicated series of conferences that were just aimed at bringing industry together to talk to FDA um, as well as CDC and how they were being used by, by, by public health and having a series of those um, really listening to industry and what their fears are and, and, and going from there. There is someone in the audience for a question. Please present yourself. Thank you very much. Okay, one extra point then on this <laughs> issue. Um, it is an analogy. Um, about 10 years ago in the Netherlands, uh, we had a nasty outbreak in hospital of AMR. And this raised a lot of questions because it was badly handled through this hospital. After that, on pressure, polit political pressure, pressure from the inspectorate, we made a, uh, a, a voluntary agreement among all hospitals to share all um, AMR information as soon as there was uh, doubt in one hospital, shared together. And this was under the condition that it was not published. So uh, it was only in a small group that looked over the shoulder and it was not published because uh, the uh, owners of the hospital, so they were so afraid for claims and so on. Now, after 10 years, um, we have no problem with that at all. So this whole thing, it is published and uh, we always ask, is it okay if these data from your hospital, your hospital, this outbreak is being published? Yeah, okay, no problem anymore. And 10 years ago, if there was an outbreak of AMR in the hospital, it was questions in parliament, it was high up in, uh, in the journals and so on. And now we have a small message in, in the newspaper and that's it. That, uh, what I'm willing to say is we must not stick too much to prejudice of, of the past years. We must move ahead and maybe there is a coalition of the willing among industry who say, okay, we go for a pilot somehow. That, um, and if there's, if an, uh, in my opinion, juridically speaking, you can also go for, for example, for a list of um, uh, uh, coding. So you have uh, in the database, in a public database, um, uh, materials uh, sequences from industry, and they are numbered so you do not say, see where it comes from. And there is a coded list, pseudonymization on this. And only when we, there is really a problem, this list goes open, something like that. Then you protect industry in a decent way. And at the same time, you can compare all kinds of uh, sequences, just as an example. But do, please do not stick to prejudice of the past but try to get the coalition of the willing. I talked to Unilever several times, and they are very willing. And these are big ones. It is uh, more among the smaller companies, especially in the meat business, in my uh, experience, that there is a, a lot of reluctance. And, uh, but maybe you can find some partners who say, okay, a good pilot. Thank you. Thank you very much. We went to the end of uh, this uh, session, so I would like to warmly thank all the speakers. So Angela Van Hoek from uh, RIVM, and you are Salmonella.
Emma Griffiths from uh, Simon, oh sorry, I cannot get. Oh, Simon University, Fraser, like Le uh, Listeria University, Canada. And Eric Stevens from uh, US FDA. And I would like, I would like also to thank all the audience for the, the nice question and also the remote audience that had a very uh, 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 yep, relevant go. questions. Thank you very much. So uh, we will uh, go to the next step. So we will have a we have a, an, uh, a speaker that will come uh, remotely. So I, I invite you to to go back to your seat. Thank you very much again. And uh, and now uh, the floor uh, is uh, to. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Carlos Dans Neves, uh, the uh, scientist executive, oh, chief exec executive from uh, EFSA. So please, <laughs> the floor is yours to wrap up uh, this uh, this uh, session. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever you are. Um, so, uh, as uh, as chief scientist uh, of uh, of EFSA, falls to me today the the chance to to wrap up what has happened. And um, first of all, I think the, the the first due thing is to say thank you very much to all those that share their knowledge today with us. Uh, these uh, six uh, amazing presentations, and of course, thanks to the organizers, so to to Mick and my colleagues in EFSA to. To Stefan and to all those that have that took, had the courage to go for a second round, I understood Stefano there were 500 on the first. My colleagues tell me there's more than 700 today, so we are growing in interest, and uh, I can at least attest that it has now reached Far East Asia since I'm I'm joining tonight from uh, from Beijing. Um, we heard six examples that um, personally give me hope. We heard six good stories. And uh, of course, no story comes without a few bumps. And uh, it's no point now to try to summarize what they have already summarized, but a few highlights that I would like to share with you as I heard this today. First, and perhaps especially on the first presentations on the, on the first session, I, I recognize and uh, I'm biased, of course, as chief science, the importance of science being done together. We talked a little about today the lack of standardization, the challenge of harmonization, different approaches. And um, there can be no doubt if we start already more united from the beginning, we will have better chances to achieve. I've, we've seen, of course, both in, in the presentations from BFR or from my colleague Dorta, the challenge of, of the regulation of different structures, of different governments. Someone was mentioning we'd like to be more like the US. We are still 27 independent member states with very diverse approaches to these topics. But if we can already unite ourselves in closing the gaps, in advancing the technology, in moving forward with innovation, we may be a little one step closer. I would like to highlight something there also that my colleague Karen Lagensen also mentioned. Whole genome sequencing is a lot more than, you know, just GATCCs. It's, it's a vast uh, range of, of disciplines that get together and need capacity building. And I'll return to that when I address One Health at the end. And I think that after the, after the break, we heard three more inspiring examples that it works, despite a lot of the of the barriers that were mentioned today. We know today that WGS is a lot more than just pathogen typing. We know of the possibilities to use it for surveillance, for predicting adaptations, all the way to looking into you know, the, um, the, the potential virulence of strains, how that can impact the lifetime of a product, the spoilage of products. And WGS, let us also keep in mind, is a, one part of omics, a field in, uh, in strong development and which will influence the future of how we regulate foods and for us risk assessors on how we assess the safety of foods. But we are closer 
and the examples in the after in the second session showed us that we are closer in networking. Thank you to the URLs showed us that we are closer in standardization in harmonization. And uh, I've learned today the importance of contextualizing not just you know, not just the the ontology, but the contextualizing data because that brings all the challenge that some people already today in the audience asked about privacy, like access to data, misuse or different uses of data. And uh, while the, the body might just be a sequence, there's a lot more around the sequence. And it is something we will continue to struggle in Europe. And uh, big data was just highlighted today, for example, by WHO, reminding us that only 13 out of 40 European countries have a structured policy for big data. And uh, I guess we agree NG uh, WGS produces a lot into big data. So the presentation gave us hope and the presentations mentioned a lot One Health. As a supporter of the term, sometimes we get challenged thinking, how do you show it works? And, uh, you know, not to go back to pandemic and zoonotic diseases, I would say it works when you listen to a day talking about whole genome sequencing. And I don't say that because more, many of you are connecting a strain from the animal to the human to the environment. That's one health. I'm saying that because through old genome sequencing, we are connecting disciplines, the transdisciplinarity, from those preparing the samples to the analysis, to the performing the sequencing, to looking into it, the molecular epidemiologists, and then all the other levels of people that will have to act on that information to make decisions. This connection of disciplines is One Health. It is also One Health because it connects a variety of countries and of sectors. We've heard today and we will hear more tomorrow also from the private sector. And there can be no doubt that the future of this, of this technology and the use of this technology will depend of an engaged United Science, a supporting and trusting, and I heard today now at the end and the questions about trust, uh, a trust of the private sector and of course a, a, a policy maker, a regulator, a risk assessor that is not seen as the bottleneck for innovation and for development but as an enabler. But let me add one last issue that I think we now all know is part of the of, of whole genome sequencing. The consumer, the people out there and I think after two years of pandemics we've all seen the importance of, of bringing them on board. I think you will agree with me that in the last two years, we've seen an exponential growth, at least online, of strain typing experts, mutation experts. Everyone knows a little more about whole genome sequencing after Corona. But this becomes then part of the assessment the consumer does. And let's remind that the consumer pushes policy. The consumer pushes the private sector. The consumer pushes the policymakers. So educating these, these people, educating the consumer, educating these generations is also part of what makes whole genome sequence One Health. At least I heard all of this and I have the feeling there will be more to be heard tomorrow. And I know that this last aspect I mentioned is a little on the table tomorrow as well as you address a little communication. And my last thought today is that uh, is to, to acknowledge that these type of meetings are important. And perhaps using here a little bit of uh, oriental uh, philosophy since I'm in Beijing, remembering that um, it's good to have knowledge, but it's wisdom that makes the difference. It's good to have knowledge about whole genome sequencing, but it's when you are together, they're in Parliament and online, when you get together to do science projects together, when you standardize together, when you talk to each other, when you convince, when you put that knowledge to work, that's wisdom. And it's wisdom that will make a difference. And Eric, I'm not sure if in 2033 we will be totally wise, but I have no doubt that we will be a little wiser than we are today. So thank you very much for the speakers. Thank you very much for all those that uh, joined today. And uh, I hope that most uh, can join us tomorrow for the continuation of this, uh, of this conference. Thank you very much. So we come to the end of, of the day. So I would like uh, again to thank all the speakers that uh, came, uh, that uh, give, gave a presentation today and uh, particularly also the audience.
pre that are in, that is in presence and uh, remotely. Uh, special thank also to uh, to EFSA organizer that are doing very well, and uh, I would like also to to thank uh, the entire EUR working group because uh, um, this um, all, all this. Uh, um, event uh, is uh, very fruitful and we see that all, the, all these exchanges that uh, we are going forward. So uh, this is very nice. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, the, the conference starts at 9 uh, and uh, we will have uh, after an uh, introduction by uh, Valentina Rizzi uh, about the highlights from day one. We'll have the section three uh, dedicated to stakeholder perspective on genomic data sharing uh, shared by Stefano Morabito. Okay, thank you very much. And I invite you to uh, join uh, the, um, the cocktail uh, that is uh, organized uh, in the hall uh, right now. Thank you very much.